The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Shall we start? This is, uh, let me just say, this is a great adventure for me uh, to be here all on my own teaching a course that involves learning from data. So it's an exciting subject and a lot of linear algebra goes into it. So it's sort of a second course in linear algebra. Uh, can I just, you'll know what, uh, so there is a stellar site established and that will be the basic thing that we use. Uh, this is a public site, uh, math.mit.edu, learning from data. And uh, so a book is coming uh, pretty quickly as we speak, or after we speak. Um, and uh, that site has the table of contents of the book, which would give you an idea of what could be in the course. And I, and I printed out a copy for everybody just of that one page. This is probably the final, first and last handout. Uh, maybe, uh, with, with the table of contents, which you'll see there. And also, you'll see there the first two sections of the book, which is what I'll talk about today and, and on a little bit into Friday. So that's, that's linear algebra, of course, because the course sort of begins with linear algebra, actually things that you would know from 1806, but you, but this is a way to say this is really important stuff. So that's what I'll do today. Uh, uh, I'd like to do some start on the linear algebra today. And uh, the, here's the great uh, facts about the course, at least we knew there were, uh, so we taught it last year, several of us together. Uh, and uh, we knew there wouldn't be a final exam, but we imagined there might be quizzes along the way. But then we couldn't think of anything to put on the quizzes. So we canceled those. <laughs> uh, but you do learn a lot, nevertheless. And so I guess we based the grades on the homeworks. So the homeworks will be partly linear algebra questions and partly online, you know, like recognizing handwriting, uh, stitching, uh, images together, m many other things, and I'll talk about those as we go. Right, good, yeah, so this, that's the general picture. And I'll say more about it today, uh, and I could answer any question about it. So we're getting videotaped, uh, so if anybody's bashful, sit at the far back, uh, but uh, it'll be fun. Yeah, you, you may know the videos for 1806, so this is like the next step, 1806-5. That's pretty uh, exciting for me. So, any question, or shall I do a little math? Why not? And then, uh, and then I'll say a little more about the course, um, just so you have an idea of what, what's ahead. And, and it looks like this room is exactly the right size to me, so I'm pleased. Okay. So, um, so what's the deal in linear algebra? Let me, I, I, I'll start, forgive me if I start with uh, what I do the very first day in 1806, which is multiply a matrix by a vector. And then I'll graduate to multiplying a matrix by a matrix, so that, and you will say, I know that stuff. But do you know it the right way? Do you think of the multiplication the right way? So let me tell you what I believe to be the right way. So let me take a matrix, uh, say 2, 3, 5, um, 1, 1, 7, and uh, 3, 4, 12. Okay, and I'll always call matrices A. Okay. 
So first step is just a times x, a times a vector. So I multiply a, a by, let's say, x1, x2, x3. And how do I look at that answer? So the choice is think of the rows of the matrix or think of the columns. And if you think of the rows, which is the standard way to multiply, you would take the dot product. So the first way is the first way is dot product of row row dotted with x. Right. 2x1 plus x2 plus 3x3. It gives you the answer a component at a time. That's the low level way. The, the good way to see it is vector wise. See this as, a, as x1 multiplies that first column, x2 times the second column, 117, and x3 times the third column, 3, 4, 12. Good. So it's a combination of vectors, and of course it produces a vector. And here we have a 3 by 3 matrix, and our vectors are in R3. And most vectors will be in R3 or Rn for this course. Um, so that's the right answer. And of course, the first component is 2x1 and 1x2 and 3x3. The same 2, 1, 3, the same dot product comes out right. But you see it like sort of all at once instead of piecemeal. So that's, you know, part of the course, I guess part of what I hope to get across is um, thinking of a matrix, uh, thinking of a matrix as a whole thing, not just a bunch of nine or, or m times n numbers, but thinking of it as a, as a thing. A matrix multiplies a vector to give another vector. Yeah, think, so that when I say ax, that you immediately think that. You immediately think, OK, AX has a clear meaning. It's a combination of the columns of A. So uh, now let me take that next step. And the next step is think about all combinations of the columns of A. We take the matrix A, and we take all Xs, and we imagine all the outputs. And what I want to ask you is, what does that look like? If I just take one x, one vector x, I get a vector output. It takes a vector to a vector. But now I take all x's, the whole, all the vectors x in, in 3D, and I get all these answers, and I think of them all together. And so I've got a bunch of vectors, infinitely many vectors, actually. And the question is, what if I plot those infinitely many vectors, what do I have? And the beauty of linear algebra is that questions like this, you can answer them, and they, you intuitively see it. You certainly see it in 3D, and you kind of have the right, right idea in 10 dimensions, even though most of us don't see too well in 10D in R10. But here we got three. OK. So, so do you see what I'm saying? I'm, I'm taking all x's. So now, so all ax gives us a big bunch of vectors. And that collection of vectors is called the column space of A. It's a space, in other words. That, 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 that's the key word there, the column space of A. And I'll just write it as C of A when I need a letters for it. OK, so I'm going to ask you, what does this column space look like? And that depends on the matrix. Sometimes the column space would be the whole of R3. Sometimes it's a smaller set in R3, a space. Do you know what it is in this case? Do I get? Do I get all of 3D out of these guys by choosing all x1 and x2 and x3? It, it, it seems like if it was a random 
matrix? The answer would be surely yes. If the, a random three by three matrix is going, its column space is going to be all of R3, its columns are going to be independent, its rows are going to be independent, it's going to be invertible, it's going to be great, but is this matrix, what's up with that matrix? No, it's not, right? So what do I get instead of all of R3? Uh, I get a plane, yeah, if you, if you get that insight. So by taking all Xs, everybody's with me, all Xs here. So, so that means that like it fills in whatever, and well, because it's linear algebra, it's going to be likely all of R3, or a plane, or even a line. What? Let me just bat over here for a moment. Give me a matrix which would, whose column space would only be a line. All ones. Okay, wow, that's a, let me liven it up a little. <laughs> three, 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 uh, eight, eight, eight. I think, okay. So I think that the combinations of those columns are all on the same line. That says that the column space is just a line. And I would say then that the matrix, so column space of this A is a line. Another way I could say this is that the rank of the matrix is one. The rank is sort of the dimension of the column space. Well, not sort of, but that's what it is. The rank is the dimension of the column space. Everybody sees that you get a line because any combination x1 of that plus x2 of that plus x3 of that is, is going to go in, in along that line. Here's the first column, here's the second column, they're all on a line, so I'll never get off that line. If I allow all x's, I'll get the whole line. Now here you said not a line, right? What was, what was the column space for this guy? Plane. Now, why isn't it all of R3? What's, what, is, what do you see that's special there? Because it is special. That's uh, making the column space sort of special, uh, a plane instead of the whole thing. Yeah, what, what's up with these three columns? The third column is the sum of these two. So the first column is fine, two, three, five. Second column is in a different direction. And when I take combinations of the first two columns, what will I get? Sorry to keep asking you questions, but that's, that's uh, anyway, that's what I always do. Uh, so the, so the, the combinations of those first two columns are a plane, because they're in different, everybody kind of sees that picture. We've got one column one going that way and column two going that way. And then if I take any multiple of column one, I've got a whole line, any multiple of column two. And then when I put the two together, it fills in the, fills in the plane. Yeah, yeah, Our, your intuition says that's right. So this is a matrix of rank. What's the rank of this matrix? Two, because it's got two independent columns but the third column is dependent. The third column is a combination of the others. So this is, matrices like this are really uh, the building blocks of linear algebra. They're the building blocks of data science. They're rank one matrices. And let me show you a special way to think, write those rank one matrices. I think of this matrix as the column vector 1, 1, 1 times the row vector 1, 3, 8. So it's a column times a row. That's a rank 1 matrix. Uh, do you see that? It's a, that's a true multiplication there. It looks a little weird, but it's a 3 by 1 matrix times a 1 by 3 matrix. These numbers have to be the same, and then the output is 3 by 3. And it's that. And you see that it factors. So I'm going to move on to that idea. The next idea coming up will be that uh, 
that we, we can see, well, that, that's coming, that we're going to see uh, matrices in, with two factors. Okay, let me, let me move to that, but, but back for this original matrix. Okay, so what's with this? The column space is a plane. So the, if I if, think about now the key idea of independent columns, how many independent columns have I got here? Two, correct, two. The third column, if I want to especially pick on that one, so I, I'll often go left to right. So I'll say the first guy is good, second guy is good, the third guy not, is not independent of the others. So I just have two independent columns. And those, are, those two columns would be a basis for the column space. So that's the, like the critical idea of linear algebra. That's what you compute with. You find a basis, and, and everything in the column space is a combination of these, including that is also, that's already a combination of those. But everything else in the column space is a combination of those two. So, so they're a basis for it. Okay, so you have the idea of A times X. You have the idea of column space of A, which allows all X's. Then now we're moving into the idea of independent columns. And the number of independent columns is the, is the rank. So the rank, shall I write that somewhere? Maybe here the rank is the number of independent columns. And right now, what do I mean by independent columns? Well, let's just see what that means by, by using it. Are we good? I'm, I know I'm reviewing here, but uh, allow me for this first class and part of next time also to review. But you'll see something new. In fact, why don't we see something new right away? Let me follow up on the idea of independence in a systematic way. So here's my matrix A. OK, can I write that again? 2, 3, 5, 1, 1, 7. And this guy was the sum of those. OK, so that's my matrix A. OK, so let's start from scratch and find a basis for the column space in, a, in the most natural way. So I'm going to take a basis. I'm going to, what, what's a basis? A basis is independent columns. So uh, the, all three together would not be a basis. But there have to be not just independent, but, but they have to fill the space. Their combinations have to fill the space. So, so two, three, five, can, let's say I want to create a basis. I'll, I'll call the matrix C, column, a basis for the column space. So here, here's a natural way to do it. I look at the first column. It's not zeros. If it was all zeros, I wouldn't want that in a basis. But it's not, so I put it in. So that's the first vector in my basis. Then I go on to the second column. If that column was 4, 6, 10, what would I do? If that co second column was 4, 6, 10, would I put it in the basis? No. But 1, 1, 7 is OK, right? 1, 1, 7 is in a different direction. It's not a combination of what we've already got. So I say, OK, that adds something new, put it in. Then I move on to the third column. Do I put that into a basis? You know the answer by now, no. Because I'm looking to see, is it a combination of these guys? And it is. It's one of that plus one of that. So it's not independent. So I've, I've finished now. I've got a, a matrix C, which was like taken directly from A. And I kept only independent columns, and I worked from left to right. 
And I can see that right away now that the rank is two. The column rank, I, I, I should say the column rank, the number of independent columns is two. Good? Now comes the key step. I'm going to produce a third matrix R, which is going to tell me how to get these columns from these columns. And its shape is going to be, well, its shape, I don't have any choice. This is 3 by 2, so R has to be 2 by something. So, so, so I'm like so. I guess it has to be 2 by 3 because I want to come out this way, 2 by 3. What am I going to do here? I'm just going to put in the numbers R that make this correct. So this is a first matrix factorization. It's not, well, it is a famous one, actually. When we see it, we'll recognize what it is. Uh, it's, it's famous in teaching linear algebra, but now actually C times R, columns times rows, has become very, very important in uh, large-scale numerical linear, numerical linear algebra. Yeah. So let's figure out what goes into R. Okay. So what's going on? What am I thinking here? I'm putting in R. That tell, so every one of these columns is a combination of these. That's the whole point. And I'm just going to put in the numbers that you need. So what goes in the first column of R? What goes in the first column of R? So I want to look what combination of that column and that column gives me this one. Yeah, one zero, one zero. Because you remember how we multiply a matrix by a vector? When I multiply that matrix by that vector, I take one of this plus zero of that. I see it vector-wise, and of course I get it right. And what about the second column of R? So the second column should be the combination that produces the second column of A correctly. What, what will that be? Zero, one, thanks. And finally, the third column. One, one, yes, right. Because one of this plus one of this produces the third column. So, so all I did was put in the right numbers there, really. Uh, right. And this is correct now. A is C times R. And so that's, this is like, uh, what I've done here is like the first two pages of section 1.1 in these uh, notes. So 1.1. And actually, so I'll tell you literally what happened. Uh, earlier this year. I was, I, I'd finished this. I wrote, I wrote this down with a different example. And then I realized something. That, that sitting here in front of me was uh, the first great theorem in linear algebra. The fact that the column rank equals the row rank. The fact that if I have a matrix where that column plus that column gives that one, oh, ooh. So what, what am I going to say here? I'm getting nervous about it. Uh, I believe that a combination of the rows gives zero. Do you believe that? I mean, you've got to believe it. This is like linear algebra. The, the matrix is not invertible, it's, it's square, but the, the columns are dependent. So the rows have to be dependent. And I don't exactly see, I, I, there's some combination of that row and that row that gives that one. And when I, of course, when I looked at the first column, I thought, okay, it's gonna be, it's gonna be too easy. One of that and one of that gives that. But, then my eye went over to the second column and I realized 
not easy at all. So you're entitled to pull out a, um, your phone and figure this out. But there is some damn combination of those, <laughs> of those two rows that gives the third row. It's, otherwise, like the course is over, we stop. <laughs> uh, but uh, well, and maybe we're going to find it or somehow. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's this is the theorem. So, I, I, so I have to tell you. I mean, you know, I was like really pleased. So the first two pages got two more pages to follow up on that idea, that here we were seeing something that I, I sort of proved in 1806, but uh, not, in a, not in the first lecture, that's for sure, and, and not, uh, not maybe so clearly. But now I, can I try to prove it? So, and so here's the, there won't be a lot of proofs in this class, but this is such an important fact. A equals CR is important factorization, and, and out of it, uh, we can connect them. So what am I saying? I am saying that all that 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 the row. So what's the row rank? Yeah, I have to back up here. What's the row rank? What's the row space? So the row rank is going to be the definite the dimension of that space. So so I look at my matrix A. What's the row space of A? I'm going to look at its rows. Now, maybe just so we don't get a whole new letters for the row space. The, uh, I'm, for me, the row space of A of a matrix. So, so first of all, tell me in words what it is. What's the row space of the matrix? Three. All combinations of the rows. All combinations of the rows. That's the space. So I would take all combinations of those rows. To get combinations of the rows, I, well, two ways I can get combinations of the rows. And the way I'll do it is I'll just transpose the matrix so those rows become columns. And then I'm back to what I did. So the row space of A is the column space of A transpose. And, and, and this has the advantage that we don't introduce a new letter. So it's, it'll be the column space of A transpose. So we don't introduce a new letter. We keep the convention that vectors are column vectors, which would be the MATLAB and, and uh, Julia and uh, um, Python convention. So is that OK? The row space is the combination of these rows, but I'll flip. I'll make them stand up, 2, 1, 3, to, to be column vectors. So it's a totally different space. And actually, in my, I happen to take a 3 by 3 example so that the column space is part of R3, and the row space is also part of R3, because my matrix is 3 by 3, a better example. I mean, and the whole point of data, data doesn't come in square matrices. Fortunately for us, data very, very often comes in matrices. But the two, the columns might be sample, might be patients, and the rows might be uh, diseases or something. I mean, they're, they're different spaces. So matrices are not likely to be square. But anyway, we're good here. OK. OK, so the row space. Now, now can I come back to the proof? Because we, the, what I want to say is that the proof of this fundamental fact is staring at us, but we don't quite see it yet. And I want to see it. So I claim that these rows are a basis for the row space. And we already saw that these columns are a basis for the column space. And 2 equals 2. 
right? Two vectors here were a basis for the column space. Now if I can see why this shows me that these two vectors are a basis for the row space, then, then I, my example is right. The, both, both of these will give two. The column rank is two, two columns. The row rank is two, two rows. So, I have to explain why I believe that these two rows are a basis for the row space. Right? Are you with me? I have to prove, I have to see why. First, are the, so when I say basis, what do I have to check? Basis is, is just, is the cr critical idea. It, I have to check that they're independent. So I haven't got too many vectors. I haven't got any extra vectors in there. And I also have to check that their combinations produce all the rows. So I say that again? That's because that's what I'm going to check. I'm going to check that those guys are independent. Well, you can see that they're independent. And I'm going to check that, the, that their combinations produce all three of these rows. If we didn't create those numbers for this purpose, but what I'm saying is they work. So I claim that this is a basis because what, what combination of those two rows would produce this, this first row? Yeah, let me just ask you that. What combination, what numbers should I multiply these two rows by to get the first row of A? Two and one. And where do you find two and one? It's sitting there in C. Uh, what, what I'm, and, and, and will it work again? Does three of this plus one of that give three, one, four? Yes, so far, so good. Does five of this and seven of that, see I'm, I'm multiplying, uh, I guess I'm doing matrix multiplication a sort of backward way or a different, different way. I'm taking combinations of the rows of the second guy. That's another way. The wonderful thing about matrix multiplication is you can do it a lot of ways. It comes out the same every way, and each way tells you something. So five of that row plus seven of that row, sure enough, is here. Do you see that that is not like accident? That, that uh, the proof is really to look at this multiplication C times R two ways. Look at it first as combinations of columns of C to give the columns. Look at it second to get as combinations of the rows of R, and that produces the rows. So that factorization A equals CR was, uh, was the key idea. And actually, this R that we've come up with, uh, has a name. Anybody remember enough 1806? Here's a, like, have you all taken 1806? I'm, uh, no, I see I, how many have? Let's, uh, yes, okay, good. For a while, 1806 was taught in a very abstract way. I said, what's going on? But anyway, so I, if you took it that semester, you maybe never heard of the column space. I'm not sure. Or, or, or by a different name. It has another name. What's its other name? The column space of a matrix. Range. I think it's the range. Yeah, right. right. Yeah, yeah. And of course, it's, uh, all this is uh, fundamental in mathematics. So of course, it, it, everything here is, is uh, has different languages and different emphasis, but you see what the emphasis is here. Okay, so you see the proof that A equals CR is, uh, just reveals everything. So it's a first idea of a factorization of, of a matrix, and, uh, and we've multiplied C times R. I could just say, because so that's really, you've seen the 
now the main point of section 1.1 of the notes to, to come up with that uh, factorization and that conclusion. And, uh, and, and you see why it, C has the same number of, the number of columns of C equals the number of rows of R, and those are the column rank and the row rank. Yeah, it's just pretty neat. And here was the special case where those column space, the column space is all multiples of U, it's a line through U. The row space is all multiples of V, it's a line through V, and uh, that's the basic building block. Yeah. Uh, can I just say another little word before I push on beyond CR? That, that this has become, if you have a giant matrix, like size 10 to the fifth, that, that's, that, that, you know, you can't put that into fast memory. You, you, it's, it's, it's a mess. How, how do you deal with a matrix of size 10 to the fifth when you cannot deal with all the entries? That, that's just not possible. Well, you sample it. So later in the course, we'll be doing random sampling of a matrix. So how, how could you sample a matrix? So you have a matrix. Of course, you're not looking at it, because, but it's, and, and you want to get some typical columns. OK, here, here, here's the natural idea. You just look at A times X when you take, let X be a random vector, random vector, random Rand of, so it's got uh, M rows and one column. It's a vector. And what can I say about AX? It's in the, what space is it in? Column. column space, thanks. That was the first idea in this, in this lecture. AX is in the column space. So if you want a random vector in the column space, I wouldn't suggest to just randomly pick one of the columns. Better to take a mixture of columns by taking a random vector X and looking at, looking at AX. And if you wanted 100 random vectors, you'd take 100 random Xs. And uh, that would give you a pretty good idea in many, in many cases of what the, what the column space looks like. That would be a, enough to work with often. Yeah, OK. Can, uh, can I just throw in another question? So, so AX is in the column space of A. Can I, let me just ask you this question. Is, is A, B, C, X, is that in the column space of A? Suppose I have matrices A, B, and C, and a vector X, and I take the product. Does that give me something in the column space of A? Yes, good for you. How, why, how do you know that? Yeah, it's A times something. Right. Putting parentheses in the right place is the key to linear algebra. And there it is, okay. That, that was just a, it's a question just occurred to me and I thought, well, I wonder if you'd do it. Okay, so we have, still time to multiply matrices. Oh, I was going to say about C and R. So these are real columns from A, but R is the rows are not taken directly from the rows of A. Actually, there's a name for this. It's called the row reduced echelon form of the matrix, and it's a big goal in, in 1806. It, it has the identity there and then the other columns uh, or tell you the right combinations. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, another big factorization would be to take columns from, from A. So this is another, so I'll put maybe or. A equals, and, and we won't be doing this for a month. Uh, we could start take columns of columns of A and put them into C if they were independent. And suppose I took rows of A. Now I'm going to take literally rows of A and put them into R. Well, shall I call it R twiddle or something? Because it'll be a different R. I'm going to use actually not. I'm not going to use 
those rows, but I'm going to take two actual rows of A, then what? So that's an important factorization, but it's not correct. Uh, it wouldn't, if I took two other rows of R, it wouldn't work. So you have to put in the middle some two by two matrix U that makes it correct. I, I just, you'll see on the, on, in the, in that section 1.1 that I got excited and uh, wrote a page about C-U-R. Yeah, so I'll just mention that. Okay. So now I'm ready. Oh, I, I wanted to say something about the course. I get excited thinking about math, but uh, there is this course. To, so what's up? Um, so there'll be uh, linear algebra problems. But, but what makes this course special is the other homeworks, which are online, and you would use, let's see, in principle, you could use any of the languages, uh, MATLAB, Python, which has become the biggest, most used for deep learning, or Julia, which is the hot new language. And uh, so last, last time, last year, the problems, oh, so what happened last year? Well, everything in this course is owed to a professor who visited from University of Michigan, Professor Rao, Raj Rao, who taught, gave most of the lectures a year ago, brought these homework problems, online homework problems, so that people brought laptops to class and we did things in class. Uh, and uh, so he had, had and has a, a very successful course at, in EE in Michigan. And, uh, but he was a PhD from here and he came back on a sabbatical and he created this, got us started. And we really owe a lot to him. Uh, also, Professor Edelman was involved with this course. And you maybe know that he created Julia. Do you, how many like know what Julia is? Oh, wonderful. That will make his day. Uh, <laughs> he tells me every time I see him, Julia's good. And I tell him I believe it. OK. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, and it's become the uh, Professor Johnson in 1806 has used Julia. And every semester, uh, Stephen Johnson gives, uh, in the first week, a uh, tutorial on uh, Julia. And so he's, that's arranged, and I promise to tell you where, where and when that is. So I, I think if you don't know anything about Julia, try to go. It's in Stata. It's on Friday at 5, 5 to 7. So Julia from Professor Johnson. So he's done this multiple times. He's good at it. Um, so that's, uh, I, I don't think we know yet what, I, I, I guess I'm hoping that you'll have an option to use all th any of the three languages. But the, the, the online thing that we give you was created in Julia. So Professor Rao had to learn Julia last spring, and the, the class did too. And there was a certain amount of bitching about it. <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, but uh, I think, with maybe one exception, who still got an A, we uh, everybody was kind of okay and was glad to learn Julian. And, and Professor Rao now uses Julia entirely, like so. He's creating a new uh, on ramp with Julia. MATLAB, by the way, has just issued an on ramp to deep learning that I'll tell you about and probably get a MATLAB, uh, somebody from MathWorks to, to uh, say something about it. Yeah, so that's what's coming, that we don't quite know uh, exactly how we'll organize those homeworks. We'll just take the first one and see, see what happens. Uh, so I'll certainly say more about homeworks when, the, when the, maybe even Friday. But are there other questions that 
I should answer. So, because some people will be thinking, okay, am I going to do this, or am I going to sit in 6036, or some other course in deep learning? Anything on your mind? To, and you can email me. Uh, so we will have a stellar site, and you'll see all the the TAs are still to be named, but. The wonderful thing is that the undergraduates who took this course last year are uh, volunteering to be graders for you guys. So uh, they will know what those online homeworks were about. Okay, so that's what's, uh, that's a sort of first word about what's coming and about, about the, the language. Okay, I'm gonna finish by a very important uh, topic, multiplying A times B. Oh, look, a clean board. So I, now I want to multiply, uh, multiply a matrix by a vector. Okay, everybody knows how to do it. You take a, 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 a row of A, so you take a row of A, and you take a column of B, and you take the dot product, so you get dot product. Row, row dot column, row dot column. That's again low level, like okay for beginners, but we want to see that mul matrix multiplication A, B in a deeper way. And the deeper way is columns times rows. Columns of A, rows of B. Columns times rows. Oh, we had a column times a row. Right? That, uh, that was this rank one example. We had a column times a row, and it produced a matrix, and that's what it looked like. And its rank was one. So those are what we have. A, so it's a combination of. It's very like AX. I'm, I'm really just extending the AX idea to AB. So, so this, this is the old way. The new way is columns. So there's column K. It will multiply. Sure enough, it multiplies row K. Everybody sees that it will happen that way. If you do it the old way, when you do a dot product of, of something here, something here, you're doing these multiplications, and when you hit column K here, you hit row K there. So, so these are connected. So, so I get things like column K of A times row K of B. And I don't know what notation to use, so I just wrote the, wrote the words. OK. But now that's one piece of the, of, of, the of the final answer, A, B. That's a rank one piece. That's a, like a building block. So I add from K equal 1, column 1 times row 1, column 1 of A times row 1 of B plus da 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 plus column K plus, and of course, I stop at column N of A times row N of B. So it's a sum of outer products. Sum of, so be, everybody sees a sum because I, I have column 1 times row 1, column K times row K, column N times row N, and then I add those pieces. It, it's just the generalization of AX to a matrix B there. So it's the sum of uh, column K, row K, of A, row K of B. And maybe we should we check that that gives us the right answer? Or maybe I, I won't do that here. But it, it's, it's, all we're doing is the same multiplications in a different order. Actually, let's just quit with one minute. We can figure out how many multiplications are there. How many multiplications to do a 
m by n matrix A times a n by p matrix B. So that's A times B. How many individual numbers, because this would determine the cost of it, how many numbers would we need? Well, suppose we do it the old way by in inner product row times column. So how many, how many multiplications to do a row times a column and get one entry in the answer? N, right? The row has length N, the column has length N, N multiplications. So that's N, and now how many of those do I have to do? MP, because what's the size of this answer? The size of this answer is M by P. Okay, so if I do, the, do it in that old order, like n multiplications to do a dot product, and I've got this many dot products in the answer, so I've got m, n, p multi multiplies. Now, suppose I do it this way. How many multiplications to do one of those guys? To multiply a column by a row. To multiply a column by a row, this, the, this, this is a m by 1, and this is a 1 by p, one column, one row. How many multiplications for that guy? mp. And how many of those rank 1s do I have to do? n. You got it? mp times n. Now, it's... The other way was, was n times uh, mp. So it gives the same answer, mnp multiplications. They're, in fact, they're exactly the same multiplications, just a different order. OK, we're at 155. Thanks for coming today. Uh, I'll talk more about the class and about linear algebra on Friday. Thank you. The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. So are we ready to go? Any questions on 18065? Uh, so it will be, as I said before, a mixture of linear algebra and uh, math uh, questions, along with online uh, using the material. OK, so I'm in this first uh, week or two uh, reviewing the highlights of linear algebra. And uh, I've reached this point to remember well, so we, I just said two words about multiplying matrices by using column times row as a, as a way to do it. And I'll, I want to illustrate that by the five uh, key factorizations of matrices. OK, so what are they? And do, do you recognize them? Everybody uses those letters. In fact, those, some of those letters, like LU or QR, would be the most used MATLAB commands in linear algebra. So A equal LU, I'll maybe say something uh, I'll develop today, but it's about elimination. Solving linear systems. So that's always the start of a linear algebra course, but I, it, it will go fast here. I just want to show you a different way to get to L times U, lower triangular times upper triangular. Probably you've seen that, those triangular matrices. So do you know what QR is? What's QR about? Least squares. Least squares is the big application. The factorization, so what kind of a matrix gets that letter Q? Orthogonal. orthogonal. The columns are orthogonal, often orthonormal. 
So orthogonal means they're perpendicular to each other, and orthonormal means they're unit vectors. So that, that uh, is, so, so Q often represents uh, a matrix with orthonormal columns. So, so you, we could say Gram-Schmidt if you want to remember a, a, a couple of old timers who, uh, whose algorithm produces Q and R. Uh, how about this one? This is really a central one in math. Pure math, applied math, everywhere, applications. So S stands for symmetric. So this is a special factorization for symmetric matrices. And you can see that it's symmetric. This lambda is the diagonal eigenvalue matrix, always lambda for, for eigenvalues. Q is like that Q, different Q, of course. That Q you can find sort of just straightforward from Gram-Schmidt. This Q involve, has the eigenvectors. So you don't find eigenvectors without some extra work. OK, so that's eigenvectors. Uh, yeah, so uh, that would be worth uh, expanding. So here are the eigenvectors of the, of the matrix S, n of them, normalized. Here are the eigenvalues, lambda 1 to lambda n. And here are the eigenvectors now transposed. OK. So remind me of the great fact about two facts, I guess. One fact about the eigenvalues and one fact about the eigenvectors. This is like an important fact in uh, 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 statement in linear algebra. What, is, what do we know about the eigenvectors? Oh, well, I guess I've given it away. The eigenvectors are orthogonal. That's very important. Makes the matrices, well, they're beautiful matrices. They're, they're the kings of linear algebra. Qs are the queens, in my opinion. Orthogonal matrices are the queens, and symmetric matrices are the kings. So, so these are orthonormal eigenvectors, and the key point, uh, uh, an important point that's implicit here is there are n of them. There's a complete set. The matrix can be diagonalized, and those, uh, well, what's special about the eigenvalues? Other matrices could be Q, lambda, Q transpose, but symmetric matrices are something additional about lambda. Yes, they're all real. They're all real. So eigenvalues are real. And eigenvectors are orthonormal, can be chosen orthonormal, can be chosen, I guess I have to say. OK, good, good, good. Oh, now maybe I'll use that as an example of matrix multiplication. So let me just do that here. Simple matrix multiplication, but it makes the point. So Q lambda Q transpose. OK. Well, what was my point about matrix multiplication? Let me, let me, it, it really involved two matrices. Here I unfortunately have three, so I'm going to have to squeeze lambda in with one of the Qs to, to see it nicely as two matrices. Shall I just do that? Yeah, I'll, I'll, there, now I've made it two matrices. That was easy. OK, now what's the rule? Uh, in, in the first notes, this was A and this was B. And when you multiply two matrices, the rule is, this is columns of Q lambda times rows of Q transpose. I'm multiplying columns by rows. And uh, so it's a column vector times a row vector. And that gives us a matrix. So each, and it's a special matrix. What, so this is a column, this is a row. And when I multiply n by 1 times 1 by n, I get an n by n matrix. And it's pretty special. And what is the special fact about, I'm sort of recalling from last time, what's special about a column times a row? Its rank is special. Its rank is 1. 
it, it, all, it's column space. Well, the only column around is this one. So all columns are multiples of this guy. All rows are multiples of this guy as we could see from an example. Shall I just do an example? One, two times three, four, to take a random example. So that would give us three, four, six, eight. And sure enough, the columns are multiples of one, two, the rows are multiples of three, four, and the rank is one. Okay, so those are the building blocks. Now I want to build something. So here we go. So this is a sum of rank one, sum of rank one, a sum of column times row. So I take column one times row one. That's my first thing in the sum. So column one of that. So you see I had to sneak the lambda in to have just a just two factors. So what's column one of Q lambda? Oh, that's a good question. So column one of Q is Q1, the first eigenvector. But now I ha I'm multiplying by this diagonal matrix. Do you, do you see in your mind what's the first column of Q lambda? Just let's think about that a second. So here's we can steal any little corner for, for, a, for a matrix. OK, so here's Q1 and the rest of the columns. And then here's lambda 1. And that's Q lambda. So I'm putting those together. And I'm asking, what's the first column of the answer? Can you see how that works? Q1 lambda 1? Yes, sorry? Q1 lambda 1? Q1 lambda 1, exactly. That lambda 1 will multiply Q1. These other lambdas multiply later columns. So the first column is lambda 1 times Q1. Right, so that's, it's the first guy, lambda 1, Q1. And then the first row of this will be Q1 transpose. That's the first guy in our sum of n things. And let me put the next one and the last one. Lambda 2, Q2, Q2 transpose, and lambda n, Qn, Qn transpose. That's really a nice way to write the, to break up the product Q lambda Q transpose. This is called the spectral theorem. So that's the symmetric, that's S. That's S there, is, is that. So that's the, we've broken up S into rank one pieces. That's, that's like a constant theme. And these rank one pieces are quite special because they're symmetric. Q1, Q1 transpose will be symmetric. And uh, oh, so can we, so, so that's just, I follow the rule for multiplying matrices. But maybe I could just check that uh, it, it's the right thing, that it came out right. Um, so what do I mean by checking? I guess I'll just check about S times Q1. So look at S, this thing, times the first eigenvector, and what do I get? OK, so you'll like this. So there's, I've split up S into a sum of rank one pieces, and that splitting is, you see it all, all, all over. Uh, it, it's really showing you what the pieces of the symmetric matrix are. And now I'm just going to check that that's a correct, a correct formula for S. So I'll multiply it by Q1, and I'm hoping to get the right thing. And what do I actually get? If I multiply this whole business times Q1, I get lambda 1, Q1, Q1 transpose, that's the first guy, times my Q1, plus, right, I'm multiplying S by Q1, and this first term gave me that. And what does the next term give me? Put, put me out of my misery here. 
It's, uh, I'm looking for this thing to simplify like mad. Okay, so what's the second term? When I multiply this guy by Q1, what do I get? Zero. That's right. That's what we want. And when I multiply the last guy by Q1, I get zero because the Qs are orthogonal. So this is all I get. And then, so I don't need this plus anymore. That's it. And then what can I do to improve that, that uh, little somewhat repetitive formula for the answer? What, what do I want to do finally? I want to remember that the Qs are normalized. They're unit vectors. So what does that tell me here? Q1 transpose. Q1 transpose times Q1. This is just 1. It's, it's the, that's what or, normalized means, that the length squared is the length, it's the length of the vector squared. And it's 1. So I can cancel that term. And I'm getting the right answer. That's all, I, that's all this was about. I was just checking and wanted to see how it would fall out, and it falls right out, that uh, this formula is the correct matrix S, because it's got the right eigenvectors, Qs, and it's got the right eigenvalues, lambdas. So it's got to be the right matrix S. Is that OK? That's a, like a, 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 a first example to see how this um, splitting into rank ones uh, gives you back what you expect easily enough. It gives you the information you expect. OK, so that's the symmetric uh, eigenvalue picture for symmetric matrices. And we'll see it again. It's, it's uh, well, all five of these are, are big, are important. I don't know if you know this one, but uh, it's going to be a foundational uh, factorization for this course and for all of data science. Do you know its name? The, so and what does it mean, first of all? Just, just a comment on this, and then we'll save it for a couple of weeks. So this U is actually an orthogonal matrix, and so is V. So it has, it has two orthogonal matrices, so that's why people called them U and V rather than Q1 and Q2, which was like too much to get subscript. So orthogonal times diagonal times orthogonal. Let me say orthogonal, diagonal, orthogonal. And 1806 would, as of now, reach this topic because it's jumped up in importance. And it's called singular value decomposition. Well, those are long words, so everybody calls it the SVD, the singular value decomposition. The point is, it, it's, it, it's the, it works for every matrix. Rectangular matrices. There's no issue of does it have enough eigenvectors or not. That's an issue here. Well, it's an issue here. Not every matrix has got enough eigenvectors to make that work. Every matrix, that one works. Because uh, instead of one set of eigenvectors, it's got two matrices, two different sets of singular vectors. Oh, we'll, we'll see that. That's, that, that. that's important. OK, so that's, a, that's really a quick overview of fundamental factorizations. And uh, I'd like to say just another word about elimination, A equal LU, and then we'll leave it, leave it alone. Um, so elimination. Yeah, do you remember that? that uh, First, that beginning of linear algebra when you're solving AX equal B, you do these row operations. Can I just, what I want to say is all those row operations that you, that you do are perfectly expressed by L times U. 
And uh, so that's, that's a key point in 1806, but I have a different way to look at it. So that's what I wanted to show you. I have a, I want to show you a sum of rank ones, a row times column. It, fit, it fits in today. So, so I just like to see why does a matrix invertible, this is a square matrix now, an invertible, and it factors, if all goes well with elimination and the pivots are non-zero, it factors into lower triangular times upper triangular. So that's a key step that, that, is, that MATLAB would do with LU of A, would produce those two factors. Now I want to do them in a column times row way, which I just realized late was, was a neat way to do it. So can I take a matrix and do elimination? How big a matrix shall I take? I'm thinking two by two. You see, you, three by three, somebody not convinced totally by two by two. Let me do a two by two, and then if you want, if you really want a three by three, I'll I'll do it. Okay, here's two by two. Two, four, three, seven. How's that? Okay. So what is, uh, yeah, so let's remember what elimination does. It subtracts a multiple of that row from that one to get to two, three, and the multiple is two, so it knocks out the four. Two threes are six, so it leaves a one. And, and, and we're, oh yeah, that, thanks for allowing me to do two by two. I've already done it now. I've reached U. So here's A, and here's U, the upper triangular guy, with the pivots on the diagonal. Good. And then the question is, express that step in matrix language. And the right answer is L times U. So the right answer is that this, that this A is, so I'll just erase that letter U, is L times U. So what is L? L is the lower triangular guy, and it has their, the number that you used here. And what was that? I subtracted two of that row from this, so I want a two there. So that, that would be, I would call that a multiplier. I multiplied row one by two, subtracted to get that zero, and for a two by two example, I was finished. Okay, now I want to see this. So there's L times U, it happened, right? I would like to see how L times U comes out of uh, this row, uh, column times row. So let me start. Let me th think again. What, so the, really the point of elimination, what, what was, why did we do this in the first place? Because here we had two coupled equations. They were coupled together. We couldn't solve them instantly. That step of elimination reduced me to, down here in this corner, one equation. I've eliminated the first unknown x from the second equ equation. So the second equation is 0x plus 1y equal right-hand side, and I solve it immediately. Okay, so how did I get to that one-by-one one problem with these guys removed? Well, it's, yeah, I'll just write, can I write here the, my parallel way to think of it, and it, two by two is pretty small, I admit. Okay, so I, I start with two, three, four, seven. I want to split it into, I want to get the first row and column in one piece, something goes there, and the 
other piece is something there. Okay. That's what elimination has done. It's taken the original matrix. It's split. It. These are both rank one. So let's just, first of all, you could tell me what goes in that blank space in the first rank one matrix. So, well, can I say this in words? The first stage of elimination pulls off from A. So A is some big matrix. It pulls off from A. It takes account of the first column and row. So it, it, uh, it writes A as, here we go, as a first column say column one, row one, plus, plus the easy part. The easy part will be a matrix with all zeros there. All zeros there, and here I have A2. Can I call it A2? This is my way now to think about what elimination is really doing. It's starting with an n by n matrix. It's pulling off a rank one matrix, which has, gets that column and that row correct, and it gets whatever it has in here, and then the rest of what's in there is A2. Do you see that we've done that here? The first step got the first row and column correct, and if it's rank one, what number goes there? Six. Six for that. And then this is the rest. This is what we have one size smaller to work on. And it looks like it was seven. Six has been used, so it's a one. That's really, uh, I want to think of this rank one matrix as the first column of L times the first row of U. And then this guy is the second column of L times the second row of U. I'm okay. I'm, I'm, I haven't uh, presented this proof in a class before. And for two by two, it's looking like overkill to me. I mean, like, why you don't have to do all that deep thinking to get. Uh, to get the pieces. But the, my idea is that it gives the, the breakdown. And this, of course, is by our column times row rule. That's LU. So we're, we're starting with A, and we're breaking it up into LU, where LU, the first piece of LU, is the first column times row. And then the next pieces are the rest of the matrix. And those get broken down. The next stage of elimination would break. If I had a three by three, this stage peeled off the first column and row. Then the next stage would peel off the second, the new second column and row. And the third stage would have the third column and row, just the last pivot. Does this make any sense to you? You could email me and say it's not that great. But uh, I think it's to, to, to see that the final result of elimination is L times U. Is, it's, uh, there's a little magic uh, in, in seeing what you're doing. And I think this is a way to see what you're doing, that you're, you're peeling off a first part to leave a second part like that. Then the second part, you would peel off the second column times the second row, maybe divide by the pivot to make it correct. And that would, that would put something in the rest of the box. And then A3 would be the rest of, of that box. OK, I'm stopping here. I'm glad you let me do two by two, since I see that three by three would have, would have ruined the day. Yeah. Okay. A question or, or let me pause for a minute. So I've talked about these factorizations. 
This one we won't see again. This one we will see big time. And this one we will. And this one we will, yeah, yeah. Two, three, and five are the ones that we're really going to see a lot of. Questions or thoughts or, OK. I guess I want to tell you now to complete today's uh, moving forward in this subject, the fundamental theorem of linear algebra. The fundamental theorem of linear algebra. OK, ready for that? Or you may have seen it already because it's like the highlight of, of, of this subject, of the basic ideas in this subject. Right, and then maybe I can, uh, after I tell you that theorem, uh, people around the world send me homework problems to do. <laughs> now, you would think any sensible professor would never do those problems, like he would say, it's your problem. But I get carried away and I solve them sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> so one came from India last week and it involved the fundamental theorem of linear algebra. Whoever teaching it there really was on, on the ball. And uh, well, I'll tell you that problem after, after the fundamental theorem. OK, fundamental theorem. It's about four subspaces. So I invented the name four fundamental subspaces. So can I list the four subspaces? Fundamental subspaces. Well, we know one of them already, the column space. So for a matrix, we're given a matrix A that's M by N of rank R. That's our, that's, our normal starting point. So what are those four subspaces and how are they related and what's their dimension and what, what those are key facts. Okay, we already know the column space. Column space of the matrix. And actually we already know the row space of the matrix. And we have the notation for that column space of A transpose. And what is the dimension? So that was the key point in the first lecture. Anybody who missed the first lecture should go back to the notes of 1.1. 1 .1. Uh, for, the, for the thinking that goes into the dimension equals what? Which of those three numbers do I want to, is the dimension of the column space? R. R. And what, what can I say about R right away compared to M and N? Yeah, less or equal. R could, I couldn't have more independent columns than I have columns. So I've got N columns. So R, R of them are independent. So R is somewhere less or equal, hopefully equal to N. What about the dimension of the row space? How many independent rows has the matrix got? R, R thank you. That's the, that's the great fact uh, with a new proof last time in section 1.1, that those have the same dimension, same dimension, which is, you know, it's, you think, oh, okay, you look at a, Simple example, it's true. But you know, if you're, if you're given a matrix that's 50 by 100, uh, really the fact that those 100 columns have the same number of independent ones as those 50 rows, that's, that's like great. OK, now the other spaces are the null space of the matrix, N of A. And just to make everything naturally symmetric, the null space of A transpose. Those are the last two. Those are the four fundamental subspaces, which you've seen, and they're even on the cover of the linear algebra textbook. OK. So what's the null space? <coughs> It's a set of vectors that solve A x equals zero. It's a set of solutions to A x equals zero. Right. Null space 
is all solutions to AX equals zero. So the null space has vector, these vectors in it, the X's. The null space isn't taken from the matrix. The row, the row space and the column space, those, those numbers are sitting in the matrix. The null space and the null space of A transpose are solutions to, the, the word null is reflecting the fact that that's a zero, and that's what makes it a space. Now, can you just, let me just ask you to think again. What's implied when I say, when I use the word space, a space of vectors? I can add, yeah, so, so you, I can do the most important operations of linear algebra in that space. I can add two vectors. Here, let me just add them. So here I'll have a, a vector x, and let me say another, another one, a vector y. Then I do addition, I follow the rules, I see that I, this can be written as ax plus y is 0 plus 0. So what have I learned? I've learned that if x is in the null space and y is in the null space, then x plus y. So the null space is, as you said, closed, meaning I don't go outside it. If x is in it and y is in it, then the sum is in it. And similarly, from ax equals 0, I get to a times cx equals zero, just multiply by c, by a number c. So those two facts, that's, that means I can do linear algebra. I can multiply by numbers and I can add. In other words, I can take linear combinations. That's what you do with vectors. And th the point is, if I do it, if I take combinations of two null space guys, I'm still in the null space. Okay. So that's the point of the null space. And uh, well, now, so now part of the fundamental theorem is to figure out how many v independent vectors are in the null space. How many solutions, independent solutions, does that system of equations have? So that will be the dimension. And I have to ask you what it is is. Let me draw a picture while you're thinking about those spaces. It's fantastic to have these beautiful clean boards. Okay, so here's my picture of the row space. Rows, and that's the column space of A transpose. And here's my picture of the null space, N of A, and that's the solutions to AX equals zero. And why have I put these two together and these two together? So the other pair will be the column space, C of A, and the null space of a transpose. So there are the four spaces. Where, where their relationship is the fundamental theorem of linear algebra. So first of all, what? So I so I have an m by n matrix. So that tells me that my rows, a typical row, has n components, right? I look at an M by N matrix, let's do a two by three matrix. So if I look at the row space, this is M and this is N. So, so I see three, the rows have length three. And of course they multiply the X's, which also have length three, X1, X2, X3. That's why these are together, because they're both in n-dimensional space. Then why are these together? Because the columns 
are in two-dimensional space for this example, and the null space of A transpose would be just two components like y1, y2 to give zeros. So do you see that this is R, these guys are in Rm. So that's the first, like get things straight. Two spaces in Rn, two spaces in Rm. Now, the, what, what am I going to ask about these spaces? I guess I already started asking and didn't wait for an answer. Their dimension. So this has dimension R. And what's the dimension? How many? This is really such a key fact. If I have M equations, AX equals zero. And if R of those equations are independent, how many solutions? So the dimension of the space is going to tell me how many solutions to AX to, to M equations, but really only R genuine independent equations in, in this system AX equals zero. How many? So, so can I ask the question again? And, I want the answer in terms of M and N and R. So I have, I really have R equations. If I look at AX equals zero, it looks like M separate equations, but, but M minus R of those are just copies or combinations of others. So there are independent equations. So what's, how many have I got? Yeah, and, th and that's what I'm going to write in here. Yeah. So yes. Yeah, so x has x has n components, and there are R real equ you know active equations that that they have to satisfy, and that leaves n minus R. That's the key point. That's the key point. That there are n components of x. N unknowns, N unknowns, and there are R constraints, independent constraints. So the, those N get, if I want to satisfy those constraints, that knocks out dimension R and leaves N minus R. So that's the dimension here. And the beauty of the, the count is that those two numbers add up to N. Everybody's accounted for. Every vector has a piece in the row space and a piece in the null space, and that's those two pieces give you back the vector. Do you, do you see that? That's just nice that the numbers come out right, and of course they come out right here too. You could say just transpose the matrix and write it, write the same thing again. What's the dimension of the column space? equals you know, the column space of the matrix has dimension R, right? And the row, well, this, this guy is left out of some linear algebra books as if it like doesn't belong. But isn't it clear that, you know, without it, everything is uh, kind of only three quarters done. We have to have this guy. And its dimension is? M minus R. Yeah, it's, yeah th that count is just for A transpose, what this count was for A. Yeah, so we've got those dimensions, R and N minus R, R and M minus R. Yeah. You, you'll, you'll have known this, but we need to see it once again in 2018 before we start using it. Now, is that the fundamental theorem? Is that all, all to it? There is? No. There is another piece to the fundamental theorem, which is sort of, you could say, the, the geometry. Here I have a subspace. Here I have a subspace of this big n-dimensional space. So I visualize those subspaces as some kind of a plane, an r-dimensional plane. 
and an n minus r dimensional plane. And I want to see how are those two planes connected. How are those two planes connected? And let me get a piece of the blank piece of the board to remember the final step. Right. So we've got dimensions r and, and n minus r, and then over here r and m minus r. Okay, and this is for the rows. This is for the null space. So this has the rows in it. This has the null, the solutions to ax equals zero. What is the beautiful geometry? The, 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 how do you visualize those two spaces? How do you visualize? Let me take an example. Let a be one, two, four, two, four, eight. Sorry about that. It's kind of a, you see it's a hooked up example. Um, so this is two by three. So there n is three. What's in the null space of this matrix? Can I, can, can you see a vector that solves a x equals zero? And in fact, how many will there be? What, what's, yeah, what's R for this matrix? Just tell me all the good stuff. For that example, M is two, N is three, and R is? One. One. Everybody sees one for the rank? The rows are dependent. It's, there's only one independent row. The columns are dependent. There's only like every column is a multiple of one, two. It's a rank one matrix. Okay, what about its, so its row space has dimension one, and its null space has dimension two, two, so because n minus r will be two. So I'm looking for a couple of vectors that both give zero. I believe there, I, I think I've only got one independent row there, so I should be able to find two different vectors that are, that solve AX equals zero. So what, what's the solution to AX equals zero? Zero minus two, one. Zero minus two, one. Yeah, that works. And what's an independent solution? Four zero, zero minus one. Zero. Four zero. Uh, don't throw me off. Four zero and minus one. Minus one. Yeah, that looks good. That looks good. And then the claim is that every solution would be a combination of those two, and that this is how many there are. And now, it's the geometry I'm completing. So we have like two minutes left in this lecture. You just have to tell me how, what's the relation between the, these guys in the row space and that guy in the null space? What's the relation between the rows of A and the solutions to AX equals zero. Between, if you see it, if you saw that vector and that vector, well, A times X is zero. Now, so what does that tell us? What do we see for the, for the relation between one, two, four, and zero minus two, one? They're orthogonal. They are orthogonal, terrific, yes. Orthogonal, I test by the dot product, zero minus four, four, add to zero, yes. So. So the, and, and that's a completely general fact. When I look at A, X equals zero, it's telling me that X is orthogonal to the rows. Do, do you see that? Just to put it in again here. If I look at A, X, A has a bunch of rows, X has one column, and I get zeros. That's the point of the null space. And that equation is just saying that row one is orthogonal because that's the dot product of row one with x. So here's row one, row two, row three, and row four with x, the rows with x, and I get zeros. So the point is then these two spaces 
are at 90 degree angles. That's really a neat picture of the four subspaces. And these two are for the same reason at 90 degree angles off in M dimensional space. So th this, is, this is the fundamental theorem of linear algebra to see that the dimensions come out right and the geometry comes out right. Yeah, and then now next time, following the notes, and I have a few more copies of the, of the, uh, hand, the one handout, uh, we'll, we'll move on quickly next week to eigenvalues and uh, positive definite matrices. Good, this is really linear algebra moving on. The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. So we're really moving along this uh, review of the highlights of linear algebra. And today it's matrices Q. They get that name there. They have orthonormal columns. So that's what one looks like. And then the key fact, orthonormal columns translates directly into that simple fact that you just keep remembering. Every time you see Q transpose Q, you've got the identity matrix. Let's just see why. So Q transpose would be, I'll take those columns and make them into rows. And then I multiply by Q with the columns. And what do I get? Well, hopefully I get the identity matrix. OK, why? Because, Q oh, yeah, the normal part tells me that the length of each vector, that's the length squared Q transpose Q, the length squared is 1. So that gives me the one in the identity matrix all along the diagonal. And then Q transpose times a different Q is zero. That's the ortho part. So that gives me the zeros. So that's a simple identity, but it, it translates uh, from a lot of words into a simple expression. Now, does that mean that in the other order, Q, Q transpose, is that the identity? That, so that's a question to, th to think about. Is Q, Q transpose equal the identity? Question. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Easy to tell which. The answer is yes. Yes, when Q is square. The answer is yes. If Q is a square matrix, a square matrix, if it, this is saying that the square matrix Q has that inverse on its left. But for square matrices, a left inverse, Q transpose, is also a right inverse. So for a square matrix, if you have an inverse that works on one side, it will work on the other side. So the answer is yes in that case. And then in that case, that's the case when we call Q is, well, we really, I don't know what the right name would be, but here's the name everybody uses, an orthogonal matrix. And that's, that's only in this square case, square. Q is an orthogonal matrix, right. Right. Do you, want to, do you want to just see an example of, of how that works? And it will not. It, so if, if Q is rectangular, let, let me do a rectangular Q and a square Q. OK. So I think there must be a board up there somewhere. Here. OK. Square. All right. Good to see some orthogonal matrices, because my message is that they're really important in all kinds of applications. Let's start two by two. I can think of two 
different ways to get an orthogonal matrix. That's a two by two matrix. And one of them you will know immediately, cos theta, sine theta. So that's a unit vector. It's normalized. Cos squared plus sine squared is one. And I, this guy has to be orthogonal to it. So I'll make that minus sine theta and cos theta. OK. Those are both length one. They're orthogonal. Then uh, this is my Q. And the inverse of Q will be the transpose. If I multiply, the transpose would put the minus sign down here and would produce the inverse matrix. And what does that um, particular matrix represent? What, why, geometrically, why do we, where do we see that matrix? It's a rotation, thank you. It's a rotation of the whole plane by theta. Yeah, so, so if I apply that to 1, 0, for example, I get the first column, which is cos theta, sine theta. And that's just, a ro let me draw a picture. That vector 1, 0 has got rotated up to, so there's the, the 1, 0. And there it got rotated through an angle theta. And similarly, 0, 1 will get rotated through an angle theta to there. So the whole plane rotates. Oh, that makes me remember a highly important, very important property of Q. It doesn't change length. The length of any vector is the same after you rotate it. The length of any vector is the same after you multiply by Q. Can I just do that? I, I claim any x, any vector x, I want to look at the length of Qx, and I claim that it has the same length as x. Actually, that's the reason in computations that uh, orthogonal matrix are so much loved, because no overflow can happen with orthogonal matrices. The lengths don't change. I can multiply by any number of orthogonal matrices, and the lengths don't change. Uh, can we just see why that's true? How would you show? So what do we have to go on? We, what we have to go on is Q transpose Q equal I. Whatever we're going to prove, it's got to come out of that, because that's all we know. So how do I use that to get that one? Well, we haven't said a whole lot about lengths, but you'll see it all now. It, it'll be easier to prove that the squares are the same. So what's the, what's the matrix expression for the length squared? What's, what's the right-hand side of that equation? X transpose X, right? X transpose X gives me the sum of the squares. Pythagoras says that's the length squared. So that right-hand side is X transpose X. What's the left side? It's the length squared of this, of QX. So it must be the same as QX transpose QX. And the claim is that that equation holds. And do you see it? Where is, so any property from Q is going to, has to just come out directly from that. Where is it here? Do I just like push away a little bit at that? left-hand side and see it? Qx transpose is the same as x transpose Q transpose. And Qx is Qx. And now I'm seeing, well, you might say, wait a minute, the parentheses were there and there. But I say the most important law for matrix multiplication is you can move parentheses or throw them away. Let's throw them away. So in here, I'm seeing Q transpose Q which is the identity, so it's, it's true, yeah. So that means that you never underflow or overflow when you're multiplying by Q. Every uh, uh, numerical algorithm is written to use orthogonal matrices if wherever it can, can. Okay, and here's the first example. I think maybe good for me to think of other examples, or for us to think of other examples of orthogonal matrices. So I'm using that word, orthogonal matrix. I should, 
it really should, we should really be saying orthonormal, and I'm really thinking mostly of square ones. So, so, the, so in the square case, when Q transpose is Q inverse. Of course, that fact makes it easy to solve all equations that have Q as a coefficient matrix, because you want the inverse and you just use the transpose. OK, let's just take a, some minutes to think of examples of Qs. If they're so important, there have to be interesting examples. And that was a first one. Now, there's one more two by two example that, I, that you should know. Uh, do you know what that would be? So another, this will be example two. And it's also going to be only two by two and real. And what possibility have I got left here? I'll, I'll use the same first column, cos theta sine theta, because that's more or less any, any unit vector in two dimensions. This has got that form. So what do, what do you propose for the second column? Yes? Yeah, put the. Put the minus sign down here. So you think, does that make any difference? So sine theta and minus cos theta. I don't know if you've ever looked at that matrix. You know, we're, we're trying to collect together a few matrices that are worth knowing, are worth looking at. OK, now what kind of what's happened here? You may say that was a trivial change, which it kind of was. But it's a different matrix now. It's not a rotation anymore. That's not a rotation. And, and uh, yeah, somehow, now it's symmetric. And uh, yeah, what, it's eigenvectors must be something or other. We'll get to those. Uh, but what, do, what does that matrix do? I don't, know, I don't know if you've seen it. If you haven't, it, it, it's not, it doesn't jump out, but it's an important case. This is a reflection matrix. Notice that its determinant is minus 1. You have minus cos squared theta, minus sine squared theta. Its determinant is minus 1. There's some, some, some uh, eigenvalue in coming up with, that, that's uh, got a minus. It, 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 yeah. OK, so what do, what do I mean by a reflection matrix? Let me draw the plane. And I think, so, so 1, 0. Let's follow, uh, follow again. 1, 0, where does that go? That gives me the first column. So as before, it goes to cos theta, sine theta. And when I say reflection, uh, let me put, put the the mirror into the picture so you see what reflection it is. The mirror is, is along here at angle theta over 2, theta over 2 line. So sure enough, 1, 0 at angle 0 got reflected into a unit vector at angle theta, and halfway between was the theta over 2 line. That's, that's not, that's OK. Now, what about the other guy, 0, 1? Here's 0, 1. OK, I multiply that. Can I put the 0, 1 up here so you just, your eye does the multiplication? Where is the result of 0, 1? What, what's the output from, uh, from Q applied to 0, 1? Sine theta minus cos theta, right? It's the, it's the second column. And so where is that? Uh, well, it's perpendicular to that guy. That's what I know, right? That, that was the point, that the two columns are perpendicular. So, it's, so it must go down this way, right? Sine theta, cos theta. And it, ha it doesn't change length. All these facts that we just learned are, are, are key. So there's, there's 0, 1, and it goes to this guy, which is whatever that second column is, sine theta minus cos theta. 
I, uh, and, and, and if you check that, actually, gosh, this is like plain geometry. I believe, it never occurred to me before, but I believe it, that, that this angle going down to there, that that goes straight through, and that the halfway one is that line. Yeah, I think that picture has got it, and I, and, and I think it's in the note. So that's a reflection matrix. Uh, well, that's a two by two reflection matrix. Would you like to see some other matrices like this one, but, but larger? They're named after uh, a guy named Householder. So these are Householder reflections. What am I doing here? I'm collecting together some orthogonal matrices that are useful and important. And uh, Householder found a whole bunch of them. And, and his algorithm is a much used part of numerical linear algebra. So he started with a unit vector. Start with a unit vector u transpose u equal 1. So the length of the vector is 1. And then he created, let's name it after him, H, he created this matrix, the identity minus 2 u u transpose. And I believe that that's a really useful matrix. So it's, it's just like, uh, I, I think this review is like going beyond 1806 into what is, what one's are really worth knowing, worth knowing individually. Okay, could we just check what are the properties of householder's reflection of that I minus two? You, you recognize here a column times a row, so that's a matrix. And what kind of a, what could you tell me about that matrix U, U transpose? It's, uh, yeah, what? So, uh, or, or what, are, what can we say about, about, about H? So I guess I'm believing that H is an orthogonal matrix. Otherwise, it wouldn't be here today. So I believe that, and not only is it orthogonal, it is also, have a look at it. Symmetric. symmetric. It's also symmetric. The identity is symmetric. UU transpose is symmetric. So that, this is a family of symmetric orthogonal matrices. And that was one of them. That's a symmetric orthogonal matrix. These matrices are really great to have. You just, like in, in using linear algebra, it's, it, it, you just get a collection of useful matrices that you can call on. And uh, th these are definitely one, one family. Well, it's obviously symmetric. Shall we check that it's orthogonal? So to check that it's orthogonal, I just, so I'm going to check that H transpose H is the identity. Can I just check that? Well, H transpose is the same as H because it was symmetric. So I'm going to square this guy. This is really H times H. I'm squaring it, and what do I get if I square? So, so I get, I hope I get the identity, but let's see it. What do I get when I square this? Get little, multiply it out. So I times I is I, and then I get some number of UU transposes. How many do I get for that, f from that? So I'm squaring this thing because H transpose H is the same as H times H. So I'm squaring it. So how many, what do I put here? Four, thanks. And now I've got this guy squared with a plus. So that's four. U, U transpose, U, U transpose. Yeah, I'm totally realizing I've practiced for a lifetime doing these dinky little calculations, but they are dinky, and uh, you, you'll get the hang of it quickly. Now, what am I hoping out of that bottom line? That it is 
I. We're hoping to get I. Do we get I? Yes. We're, who sees how to get I out of that thing? Yeah. You transpose U in here is a number. That was U, that was column times row times column times row. And I look at the, in the middle here is row times column, and, and that's the number one, right? Because it's there. So that's one, and then I have minus four of that, plus four of that. They cancel each other, and I get I. So those are good matrices. We'll, we'll use them. We'll use them. Actually, they're better than Gram-Schmidt. So we'll use them in, in making things orthogonal. So what, what other orthogonal matrices? Let, let's create some. You know, creating good orthogonal matrices is, uh, you know, it's, it, it pays off. Let's think. Uh, so uh, there's a family named after this French guy. who lived to 100. He was a real old timer. Well, MIT had a faculty member in math uh, when I came, Professor Stroik, who lived to 106. And I heard him give a lecture at Brown University at age 100. And it was like perfect. You could not have done it better. So he's my inspiration. I am keep going. <laughs> I only have like n more years to get there. And then is well, it's too many anyway. OK, Adam Ard. <laughs> All right, Adam Ard. So Adam Ard, he created, well, that's the simplest, the, the smallest. Uh, now, the next guy is going to be 4 by 4. I'm going to put that. So where I see a 1, I'm going to put Adam Ard in. 1, 1, 1 minus 1. 1, 1, 1, minus 1. And then when I see a minus, I'm going to put it in with a minus. You, you, you saw that picture? It was a picture of h2, 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 and minus h2. That's what I've got there. And I believe those columns are orthogonal. Right? Now, what could I do? Well, it's not quite an orthogonal matrix. What do I have to do to make? This isn't quite an orthogonal matrix either. What, what do I do to make that an orthogonal matrix? Divide by square root of 2. I need, I need unit vectors there. And here, uh, those lengths are 1 squared, 1 squared, uh, 4. Square root of 4 is 2. So I better divide by the two there. And now here I'm gonna here I'm up to yeah. So that was that one. Tell tell me the next one up. What's that gonna be? Eight by eight? What's that? So this is H four here. Oops, four. So tell me what I should do for eight by eight. You you you'll think this is like simple, but that's that's a good thing to say about it. Uh, you, you know, there in in coding theory, all sorts of places, you want matrices of ones and minus ones. Okay, what's H eight? I'm going to build it out of H four. So what am I going to? What's it going to be? I'm going to put an H four there. What am I going to put here? Another H four, and up here, another H four, and finally here. Minus h, and I think I've got orthogonal columns again, right? Because the the columns within these dot products with themselves give zero and zero. The dot products from these columns and these columns obviously have the minus, and the dot products in here are zero from that and zero from that. Yeah. It works. And we could keep going to 16 and 32 and 64. Uh, but then 
up comes a question. Uh, what about H12? Is there a ones and minus ones matrix of size 12, 12 by 12? It, it, it doesn't come directly from our little pattern, which is doubling size every time, but you could still hope, and it works. There is a, I don't know what it is, but there's a, there's a matrix of ones and minus ones, orthogonal, 12 orthogonal columns. So the answer is yes. Okay. So we make an 18065 conjecture. Every matrix, every matrix size, well, not every matrix size, because three by three is not going to work. One by one is not going to work either. Uh, but H12 works, H8, H16. What's our conjecture? We won't be the first to conjecture it. That there is a ones and minus ones orthogonal matrix with orthogonal columns of every size n. So always, so, so I'll start the conjecture. Always possible if n, which is the size of the matrix, let's say, what, what would you guess? Just take a shot. You won't be asked for a proof because nobody has the proof. Um, even, well, you could hope for even. You could look for, try six, I guess, would be the first guy there, and I don't think it's possible. I think six is not possible. So every even size is, is, is I think, not going to work, but it's a natural idea to try. What's the next thought? Every multiple of four. If n over four is a whole number. So, uh, but nobody has a way, a systematic way to create these things. So, like some of them, are, we're, at this point, we're down to doing it one at a time. And we're up to 668. But we haven't got that one yet. Isn't that crazy? So all this is coming from Wikipedia, my source of, <laughs> my sor my, my source of all that's good in mathematics is there on Wikipedia. Anyway, this is the conjecture. Conjecture means you don't have any damn idea of whether it's true or not. Uh, that every, uh, is that divisible by four? Yeah, I guess it would be, right? 600 certainly is and 68 certainly is, yeah. Okay, so I think that's the first one that's, so anybody, if, if you find one of size 668, just skip the homework and tell us about that one. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't think I'll assign that, yeah. I guess, well, yeah, I must have searched for it online, but uh, it's, it, yeah. Anyway, that, so th those are the Adamard matrices. Now, where else do I remember orthogonal matrices coming from? Well, yeah, really the biggest source of so when I'm looking for orthogonal matrices, I'm looking for a, a, a basis of orthogonal vectors. And where in math am I going to find vectors that come out to be orthogonal? We haven't seen that's the next section of the notes, but maybe you're remembering. Where will we sort of like automatically show up with orthogonal vectors? They could be the eigenvectors of a symmetric. symmetric matrix. And that's where the most important ones come from. Oh, I, I could tell you about wavelets, though. Wavelets are more like this picture. They're ones and minus ones. Or the simplest wavelets are ones and minus ones. Can I, can, before I go on to the, to the eigenvector business, can I mention the wavelets matrices? Yeah, the, these, are, these are really important, simple and important constructions. So wavelets, let me, yeah, let me draw a picture of, so, so I, I'm going to come up with four, I'll do the four by four case. 
and and this is these these are the orthogonal guys, and then the next one is up and down and zero, and the last one is zero and up and down. So that's that's four things, but let me show you the matrix. So I'll call it W for wavelets. So that guy I'm thinking of as 1, 1, 1, 1. This guy I'm thinking of as 1, 1, minus 1, minus 1. It's looking sort of Atomard way, but, but there's a difference here. This guy is 1, minus 1, 0, 0. So the wavelets rescale. That's, that's the difference between Atomard and wavelets. Wavelets are scaling. Uh, self-scaling. And what's the last guy here? What's the fourth column from that fourth wavelet? Zero, zero, zero one, minus one. Yeah. So Haar came up with that. This is the Haar wavelet, which was uh, many years before the word wavelets was invented, he he came up with this construction: the Haar the Haar the Haar matrix, the Haar functions. So they're very simple functions, but you know you can that makes them usable. That's the fact that they're so simple. Now, I don't know if you want to see the pattern in eight by eight, but I, let me start the eight by eight. So you you'll know what wavelets are about. You'll know what these Haar wavelets are about anyway. They're, they're the ones that were, that were kind of easy to visualize. So let's, let's, this was, if that's W4, let's, let's just take a minute. It won't take long for W8. OK. So the first column is going to be eight ones. OK. And what's the next column going to be? Four ones and four minus ones, like so. So four ones and four minus ones. OK, and now the next column. Two ones, two minus ones, and zeros, right? One, one, minus one, minus one, and zeros. And the fourth will be zeros and two ones and two minus ones. We got half a matrix now. Now, if we just tell me the fifth, I'm, uh, what do you think? What, what do I put in the fifth one? So again, it's going to squeeze down and rescale. And what, what's the fifth column up here that's going to be? ones and minus ones and zeros now. So it's not Atomard, it's Har. And uh, what shall I put? One, one, how's, shall I start with one, one? One minus one. Oh, one minus, <laughs> yeah. I'm, oh. And then all zeros? Oh yeah, thanks, perfect. One minus one and then all zeros. And then the next three columns this will have the one minus one here and the 1 minus 1 here, and the 1 minus 1 here, and otherwise all zeros, yeah. So you see the pattern. It's scaling at every step. And, uh, and th th so that matrix has the advantage of being quite sparse, sort of. This, this in my mind, is a, or four ones, that, that's involved with like taking the average. Then this guy is like taking the differences, differences between those and those. And then this is like taking the difference at a smaller scale, and that also at a smaller scale. So that's what we keep doing. Yeah, yeah. So that's wavelets. It looks so simple, right? But it, uh, the, the uh, just a, a one minute history of wavelets. So Haar invented this in like 1910. I mean, along. 
forever. But then uh, you wanted wavelets that were a little better. And uh, not just ones and minus ones and zeros. And uh, it, it, that took some, some, a lot of thinking. A lot of people were searching for it. And Ingrid Dobeshi, so I'll just put her name, became famous for finding them. So in about 1988, uh, she found uh, a whole lot of families of wavelets. And when I say wavelets, she found a whole lot of orthogonal matrices that, were, that had good properties. Yeah. So that's, that's the wavelet picture. OK. Now, to close today and to connect with the next lecture on eigenvalues, eigenvectors, positive definite matrices, we're really getting to the heart of things here. Uh, let me follow through on that idea. So the eigenvectors of a symmetric matrix, but also of an orthogonal matrix, are orthogonal. And that is really where people, where you can invent because you don't have to work hard. You just find a symmetric matrix. Its eigenvectors are automatically orthogonal. That doesn't mean they're great for, for use, but some of them are really important. And the, maybe the most important of all is the Fourier. So you probably have seen Fourier series, sines and cosines. Those guys are orthogonal functions. But the discrete Fourier series is what everybody computes. And those are orthogonal vectors. So the orthogonal vectors uh, that go into the discrete Fourier transform, and, and then they're done at high speed by the fast Fourier transform, those are eigenvectors of Q, eigenvectors of the right Q. So let me just. Uh, invent a, the right, tell you the right Q uh, that get, whose eigenvectors, so, so I, uh, here we go, eigenvectors of Q, let me, you will just be amazed by how simple this matrix is. It's just that matrix. It's a, called a permutation matrix. It just puts the, those are the Fourier, four Fourier uh, discrete, discrete, let me put the word discrete up here, transform. So I really meant to put discrete Fourier transform. Yeah. The eigenvectors of that matrix, first of all, they are orthogonal. And then, second and more important, they're, they're tremendously useful. They're the, they're the heart of signal processing. You know, in, in, uh, in uh, signal processing, they just take the discrete Fourier transform of a vector before they even look at it. I mean, that's, like, that's the way to see it, is split it into its frequencies. And that's what the eigenvectors of this will do. So we're going to see the discrete Fourier transform. And, but my point here is to know that they're orthogonal is, just comes out of this fact that the eigenvectors are orthogonal for any Q, and that is a, certainly a Q. Everybody can see that those columns are orthogonal. The columns of a, per, that's a permutation matrix, right? It's a, you've taken the columns of the identity, which are totally orthogonal, and you just put them in a different order. So a permutation matrix is a reordering of the identity matrix. It's got to be a Q, and therefore its eigenvectors are orthogonal, and they're just the winners. I mean, that, 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 
the, the, the matrix of the Fourier matrix with those four eigenvectors in it. I'll show you now. Okay, so this is really, we're finishing today by leading into Wednesday, eigenvectors and eigenvalues. And we happen to be doing eigenvectors and eigenvalues of a Q, not today of an S. Mo mo most of the time it's a symmetric matrix whose eigenvectors we take, but here that happens to be a Q. Sh can I show you the eigenvectors? The four eigenvectors of that, now, oh, the complex number i is going to come in. You have to, you have to let it in here. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Uh, the ma if, S, if S is a real symmetric matrix, its eigenvectors are real. But if Q is an orthogonal matrix, its eigenvectors, even though it's, you know, you couldn't ask for a, more real matrix than that. But its eigenvectors are, at least, yeah, the one, the, the good way are, are uh, complex numbers. So can I show you the eigenvectors of, okay. okay. So again, overall, the point today is to see orthogonal matrices. So I'll just repeat now while I can. Rotations here. Uh, reflections. Wavelets. Um, uh, the householder idea of reflections of, of big, uh, large matrices that have this form I minus two UU transpose are orthogonal, and now we're going to see the big guys, the, the uh, eigenvectors of Q. Right. Yes? Oh, yeah, we don't have orthonormal. That's right, we don't have orthonormal. I better div divide by square root of 8. Right. Oh, yes, oh, you're right. I, <laughs> sorry, I thought I'd get away with that, but I didn't. Uh, yeah, so these guys are square roots of eight, so are these, but these guys are square roots of four, and these guys are square roots of two. Thank you. Absolutely right. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so what are the eigenvectors of, of, a, of a permutation? This is going to be uh, nice to see. And I'll, I'll use the matrix F for the eigenvector matrix. Of, 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 that, of, that, of that Q up there, and F is for Fourier, and it'd be the four by four Fourier matrix. Okay, what are the eigenvectors of Q? Okay, so Q is a permutation. So like, I'm gonna ask you for one eigenvector of every permutation matrix. What, what vector can you tell me that it, actually the eigenvalue will be one. What vector can you tell me where if I permute it, I don't change it? One, 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 one. It's like it's everywhere here. One, 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 one. So that's the zero frequency Fourier vector, the constant vector, all ones. Everybody sees that if I multiply by Q, it doesn't change. Okay, now the next one, I'll show you the four now. Uh, the next one will be one i, i squared and i cubed. Of course, i squared, is, I don't know how many course six J people are in this audience, but <laughs> this is a mass building, we paid for it, it's 2190 and it's i in this room. Yeah, so, uh, uh, yeah. Um, Anyway, I is the first letter in, in what? Imaginary, thank you. The first letter in imaginary. You, know, you can't say imaginary. So, <laughs> so, so that's it, okay. And then the next one is one I squared, I fourth, I six. And the next one is one I cubed, I six, and I nine. That's, isn't that just beautiful? 
And you could show that every one of those four columns, if you multiplied them by Q, you would get the eigenvalues. And uh, you, you would see that it's an eigenvector. And this is just sort of like a discrete Fourier stuff, and you know, instead of e to the i, e to the i x, e to the two i x, e to the three i x, and so on, we just have vectors. But I, I, so those are the four eigenvectors of the of that of that permutation, and those are orthogonal. Could I just check that? How do you know that this first column and the second, well, I should really say zeroth column and first column if I'm, if I'm uh, talking frequencies. Do, do you see that that's orthogonal to that? Well, why is 1 plus i plus i squared plus i cubed equals 0? That's the dot product. This is column 1 dot column 2. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. This happens to come out zero. Is that right? Yeah, that'll come out zero. But somebody mentioned that this isn't right. This is, I mean, that, it's true that that came out zero. But when I have imaginary, vector, imaginary numbers anywhere around, that, this isn't the correct dot product to test orthogonal. If, if I have imaginary, ve complex vectors, if I have complex numbers, complex vectors, I should test column one conjugate dotted with column two, or uh, column i conjugate. Well, let me take column, uh, <laughs> see, what, which one shall I take? Maybe that guy and that guy. M many of them, you luck out here. but. But really, I should be taking the conjugate. So, so, so these ones. But that, the thing is, the, conju the complex conjugate of one is one. So that was that was okay. But in general, if I wanted to take column two dotted with column, I don't know, maybe four would be a little dodgy. Yeah, look, look what happens. Take that column and that column. Take their dot product. Do it the wrong way. So what's the wrong way? Forget about the complex conjugate and just do it the usual way. So 1 times 1 is 1. i times i cube is 1. i squared times i6 is 1. I'm getting all 1s. I'm not getting uh, orthogonality there. And that's because I forgot that I should take the complex conjugate, well, of these guys, 1. I should take minus i, minus i squared, minus i. Well, that's real, so it's OK. Minus there. So, so minus i squared is still uh, minus 1. So now if I do it, it, it comes out 0. So, so let, let me repeat again. Let me just make this, this statement. If Q transpose Q is I, and Q X is lambda X, and Q Y is a different eigenvalue Y, OK. So I'm, I'm setting up the main fact that in, in the last minute, I'm just going to write down. So I have an orthogonal matrix. I have an eigenvector with eigenvalue lambda. I have another eigenvector with a different eigenvalue mu. Then the claim is that, what is the claim? About the eigenvectors. So here it has one eigen, this has an eigenvalue. This has a different eigenvalue. I, I need them to be different to really know that they're, the x's and the y's can't be the same. So what is it that I want to show? Yes, that x, I, and I have to remember to do that, x transpose y is 0. That's orthogonality. That's orthogonality for complex vectors. I have to remember to take the, to change I, every i to a minus i in one of the vectors. 
And I can prove that fact by playing with these, uh, these by playing with starting from here, I can get to that. OK, that's it. we've done a lot today. A lot of stuff about orthogonal matrices. Imp important ones and the sources of important ones, eigenvectors. And so it'll be eigenvectors on Wednesday. The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. So last time was orthogonal matrices, Q. And this time is symmetric matrices S. So we're really talking about the best matrices of all. Well, I'll start with any square matrix and about eigenvectors. But you've heard of eigenvectors more than, more than once, more than twice, more than 10 times, probably. OK. So eigenvectors. And then let's be sure we know why they're useful. And uh, maybe compute one or two. But then we'll move to symmetric matrices and what is special about those. And then even more special and more important will be positive definite symmetric matrices. So that when I say positive definite, I mean symmetric. So start with A, next comes S, then come the special S special symmetric matrices that have this extra positive definite property. OK, so start with A. So an eigenvector, if I multiply A by x, I get some vector. And sometimes, if x is especially chosen well, Ax comes out in the same direction as x. Ax comes out some number times x. So there are normally there would be for an n by n matrix. So let's let's put, say n, a is n by n today. Normally, if we're if we live right, there will be n different independent vectors, x eigenvectors, that have this special property. And we can compute them by hand if n is 2 or 3, 2 mostly. Uh, but the computation of the x's and the lambdas, so this is, this is for i equal 1 up to n, if I use this sort of math shorthand, that I have n of these almost always. And uh, my first question is, wh what are they good for? Wh why why do, uh, does course after course introduce eigenvectors? And to me, the key property is seen by looking at a squared. So let me look at a squared. So that's another n by n matrix. And we would ask, suppose we know these guys. Suppose we found those somehow. What about a squared? Is x an eigenvector of a squared also? Well, the way to find out is to multiply a squared by x and see what happens. Do you see what's going to happen here? This is a times ax, which is a times ax is lambda x. And, and now what, what do I do now? Because I'm go shooting for the answer, yes. x is an eigenvector of a squared also. So what do I do? That number, that lambda is just a number. That's the, I can put it anywhere I like, so I can put it out front. And then I have ax, which is lambda x, thanks. So I have another lambda x, so that's lambda squared x. So I learn the crucial thing here that x is also an eigenvector of a squared, and the eigenvalue is lambda squared. 
And of course, I can keep going. So a to the nth x is lambda to the nth x. We have found the right vectors for that particular matrix A. What about A inverse x? That will be, if everything is good, 1 over lambda x. Well, yeah, so uh, any time I write 1 over lambda, my mind says, you, you, you've got to like make some comment on the special case where it doesn't work, which is, if, yeah, if, if lambda is not zero, I'm golden. If lambda is zero, it doesn't look good. And but what's happening if lambda is zero? A doesn't even have an inverse. If lambda was zero, which it could be, no, no, no rule against it. If lambda was zero, this would say A times the eigenvector is zero times the eigenvector. So that would tell me that the eigenvector is in the null space. It would tell me that the matrix A isn't invertible. It's taking some vector x to 0. And uh, so, so the, everything clicks. This works when it should work. And uh, if we have other fun any function of the matrix, we could define the exponential of a matrix. 1803 would do that. Let's just let's just write it down as if we know what it means. Does it have the same eigenvector? Well, sure, because e to the a t, the exponential of a matrix. If I see e to the something, I think of that long infinite series that gives the exponential. Those all the terms in that series are have powers of a, so everything's working. Every term in that series. X is an eigenvector, and when I put it all together, I learn that the eigenvalue is e to the lambda t. Yeah, that's just a t typical and, and, and successful work, use. OK, so that's eigenvectors and eigenvalues, and, and uh, uh, we'll find some in a minute. Now. So I'm claiming that this is the that this that, that from this first thing, which was just like about certain vectors are special. Now we're beginning to see why they're why they're useful. So special is good, useful is even better. So so let me take uh, take any vector, say v, and OK, what do I want to do? I want to use eigenvectors. This v is probably not an eigenvector. But I'm supposing that I've got n of them. You and I are agreed that there are some matrices for which there are not a full set of eigenvectors. That's really the, the main sort of annoying point in the whole subject of linear algebra is some matrices don't have enough eigenvectors, but almost all do. And let's go forward, assuming our matrix has. OK, so if I've got n independent eigenvectors, that's a basis. I can write any vector v as a combination of those eigenvectors. Right. And then I can. Find out what a to the to any power. So that's the point. That that this is this is going to be the, the simple and and reason why we like to have we like to know the eigenvectors because if I choose those as my basis vectors, v is a combination of them. Now if I multiply by a or a squared or a to the k power. Then it's linear, so I can multiply each one by a to the k. And what do I get if I multiply that guy by a to the kth power? OK, well, I'm just going to use, or here I said n, but let me say k. Because n, I'm sorry, I'm using n for the size of the matrix, so I better use k for the, for the typical case here. So what do I get? 
just helped me through this, and, and we're happy. Uh, so what happens when I multiply that by a to the k? It's an eigenvector, remember. So when I multiply by a to the k, I get c1. That's just a number. And a to the k times that eigenvector gives lambda 1 to the k times the eigenvector. Right? That's the whole point. And linearity says keep going, cn, lambda n to the kth power, xn. In other words, I, have a, I can take, uh, I can apply any power of a matrix, I can apply the exponential of a matrix, I can do anything quickly because I've got the eigenvectors. So really, so I'm saying the first use for eigenvectors, maybe the principal use for which they were invented is to be able to solve difference equations. So, so this, so let me, if I call that VK, the case power, then the, the equation I'm solving here is a one-step difference equation. This is my difference equation, and if I wanted to use exponentials, the equation I would be solving would be dv dt equal a v. Solution to uh, uh, discrete steps or continuous time uh, evolution comes is trivial if I know the eigenvectors because here is the solution to this one and the solution to this one is the same thing c1 e to the lambda 1 t x1 is that what you were expecting for the for the solution here because if I take the derivative it brings down a lambda if I multiply by a it brings down a lambda so plus the other guys Okay. Not news, but important to remember what eigenvectors are for in the first place. Good. Um, yeah, let, let me move ahead. Oh, one, one matrix uh, fact. is about something called similar matrices. So I have on my matrix A, then I have the idea of what it means to be similar to A. So B is similar to A. Or, yeah, what does that mean? So here's, here's what it means, first of all. It means that B can be found from A by, this is the key operation here, multiplying by a matrix M and its inverse, M inverse AM. When I see two matrices, B and A, that are connected by that kind of a change, M could be any invertible matrix, then I would say B was similar to A. And that change, that, that, that appearance of M is pretty natural. If I change variables here by M, then I get that similar matrix will show up. So what's the key fact? Do you remember the key fact about similar matrices? If B and A are connected like that, they have the same eigenvalues. So this is a, just a useful point to remember. So I'll, I'll, this is like one fact in the, in the discussion of eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So similar matrices, same eigenvalues.
Yeah. So in, in some way, in the eigenvalue, eigenvector world, they're, they're in this, they belong together. They, they're connected by, by this uh, relation that just turns out to be the right thing. Actually, that is, that gives us a clue of how eigenvalues are actually computed. Well, they're actually computed by typing eig of a with parentheses around a. That's how they're in, in, in real life. Um, but what happens when you type eig of a? Uh, well, you could say the eigenvalue shows up on the screen. Uh, but, but something had to happen in there. And uh, what happened was that uh, MATLAB or whoever took that matrix A, started using good choices of M, better and better, you know, took, took a bunch of steps with different M's, because if I do another M, I still have a similar matrix, right? If I, if I take B and do a different M2 to B, so I get something similar to B, then that's also similar to A. I've got a whole family of similar things there. And what does, it, what does MATLAB do with all these M's, M1 and M2 and M3 and so on? It brings the matrix to a triangular matrix. It, it gets the eigenvalues showing up on the diagonal. It's just... It is a tremendously, it was an inspiration uh, when that, uh, when, the, when the good choice of M appeared. And, and let me just say, because I'm going on to symmetric matrices, that for symmetric matrices, everything is sort of clean. Uh, you're not, you not only go to a triangular matrix, you go to a, toward a diagonal matrix. The, the off you, you choose M's that make the off-diagonal stuff smaller and smaller and smaller, and the eigenvalues are not changing. So there, shooting up on the diagonal, are the eigenvalues. So I, I guess I should uh, verify that fact, that similar matrices have the same eigenvalues. Can we, you, you, there can't be much to show. There can't be much in the proof, because that's all I know. And I want to know its eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So let me say, suppose M inverse A, M has the eigenvector Y and the eigenvalue of lambda. And I want to show, do I want to show that Y is an eigenvector also of A itself? No. Eigenvectors are changing. Do I want to show that lambda is an eigenvalue of A itself? Yes, that's my point. So can we see that? Ha! Can I see that lambda is an eigenvalue? There's, like, there's not a lot to do here. I mean, if I can't do it soon, I'm never going to do it because, uh, so what am I going to do? Find the vector x equals m y. Then... Yeah, I could, yeah. Uh, X is, uh, MY is going to be a key, and I can see MY coming. Just when I see M inverse over there, what am I going to do with the darn thing? I'm going to put it on the other side. I'm going to multiply that equation by M. So I'll have, that will put the M over here, and I'll have A M Y equals lambda M Y, right? And is that telling me what I want to know? Yes. That's saying that MY, that you wisely suggested to give a name X to, is lambda times MY. Do you see that? that? That the eigenvalue lambda didn't change. The eigenvector did change. It changed from Y to MY. That's the X, the eigenvector of X. This is lambda X. Yeah. So that's the role of M. It just, it just gives you a different basis for eigenvectors, but it does not change eigenvalues. Right. Yeah. Okay. So those are similar matrices.
Yeah, some other good things happened. A lot of people don't know. In fact, I wasn't like very conscious of the fact that A times B has the same eigenvalues as B times A. Well, I, mean, I should maybe write that down. A, B has the same eigenvalues, the same non-zero ones. You'll, you'll see, I have to, as B, A. This is any A and B, same size. I'm not talking similar matrices here. I'm talking any two A and B. Uh, yeah, so that's a, a, a good thing that happens. Now, could we, could we see why? And then I'm going to be really pretty happy with basic facts about eigenvalues. So, so if I want to show that two things have the same eigenvalues, what, what do you propose? Show that they are? Similar. I already said if they're similar. So is there an M? Is there an M that will connect this matrix? So is there an M that will multiply this matrix that way? So that will be similar to AB. And can I produce BA then? So I'll just put the word want up here. I want, if, if, I, if I have that, then I'm done. Because that's saying that those two matrices, A, B, and B, A are similar. And I know that then they have the same eigenvalues. So are they, wh what should M be? M should be? Um, so what is M here? I want that to be true. Should M be B? Yeah, M equal B. Boy, not the most uh, uh, hidden fact here. Take, take M equal B. So then I have B times A times B, B inverse which is the identity, so I have B times A. Yes, OK. So, so A, B, and B, A are fine. Now, what do you think about this question? Are the eigenvalues, I now know that A, B, and B, A have the same eigenvalues. And the reason I had to be careful about non-zero is that if I had zero eigenvalues, then uh, yeah, I, I, I can't count on those inverses, right, right. So, so that's why I'm, I put in that little qualifier. But now I want to ask this question. If I know the eigenvalues of A separately by itself, A, and uh, of B, now I'm talking about any two matrices, A and B, uh, if, if, if I have two matrices A, I, I, I have a matrix A and a matrix B, and I know those are eigenvalues and their eigenvalues, what about AB, A times B? Can I multiply the eigenvalues of A times the eigenvalues of B? Don't do it, right, yes, right. The eigenvalues of A times the eigenvalues of B could be damn near anything, right? They, they, they're not connected to the eigenvalues of A, B, especially. And maybe some, something could be discovered, but not much. And similarly for A plus B. That, so, yeah. So, so I, 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 let me just write down this point. Eigenvalues of A plus B are generally not eigenvalues of A plus eigenvalues of B. Generally not. Just there's no reason, and the the reason that that's I get that no answer is that the eigenvectors can be all different. If the eigenvectors for A are totally different from the eigenvectors for B, then A plus B will have probably some other totally different eigenvectors, and there's nothing nothing happening there. 
So that's sort of a thoughts about eigenvalues in general. And I could, there, there'd be a whole section on eigenvectors, but I'm really interested in eigenvectors of symmetric matrices, so I'm going to move on to that topic. So now, having talked about any matrix A, I'm going to specialize to symmetric matrices, see what's special about the eigenvalues there, what's special about the eigenvectors there, and, and I think we've already said it in class. So let me let me ask you to tell me back, tell me again. So I'll call that matrix S now. As a reminder, always that I'm talking here about symmetric matrices. So what do I? What are the key facts to know? Eigenvalues are real, real numbers. If the matrix is, I'm thinking of real symmetric matrices. Of course, other real matrices could have imaginary eigenvalues. Other real matrices, so just, let's just think for a moment. Yeah, maybe I'll just put it here. Can I back up before I keep going with symmetric matrices? So, so take a matrix like, like, like that. Q, yeah, that would be a Q, but it's not especially a Q. Maybe the, maybe the most remarkable thing about that matrix is that it's anti-symmetric. So I'll call it A for, right? If I transpose that matrix, what do I get? Negative. The negative. So that's like anti-symmetric. And I claim that an anti-symmetric matrix has imaginary eigenvalues. So that's a... That's a, that's a 90 degree rotation. And you might say, what well, could be simpler than that? A 90 degree rotation, that's not a weird matrix. But from the point of view of eigenvectors, something's a little odd has to happen, right? Because if I have a 90 degree rotation, if I take a vector x, any vector x, could it possibly be an eigenvector? Well, apply A to it. You'd be off in this direction, AX. And there is no way that AX can be a multiple of X. So there's no real eigenvector for that, for that anti-symmetric matrix or any anti-symmetric matrix. Yeah. So you see that when we say that the eigenvalues of a symmetric matrix are real, we're saying that this couldn't happen that this couldn't happen if A were symmetric, and here it's the very opposite, it's anti-symmetric. Well, while that's on the board, you might say, wait a minute, how could that have any eigenvector whatsoever? Uh, so what is an eigenvector of that matrix A? How, how do you find the eigenvectors of A? Uh, when they're two by two, that's a calculation we know how to do. Um, you, you remember the steps there? I'm looking for AX equal lambda X. So right now I'm looking for both lambda and X. I've got two that's not linear, but I'm going to bring this over to this side and write it as A minus lambda I X equals zero. And then I'm going to look at that and say, wow, A minus lambda I must be not invertible because it's got this x in its null space. So the determinant of this matrix must be 0. I couldn't have a, uh, a null space unless the determinant is 0. And then when I look at a minus lambda i, for this a, I've got minus lambdas minus a, oh, a is just a 1, and that's minus 1. I'm going to take the determinant, and what am I going to get for the determinant? Lambda squared plus 1. And I set that to 0. So 
So I'm just following all the rules. But it's showing me that the lambda, the two lambdas, there are two lambdas here. But they're not real because that equation, the roots are i and minus i. So those are the eigenvalues. And they have the nice, they have all the, well, they are the eigenvalues, no doubt about it. Um, with two by two, there are two quick checks that tell you, yeah, you did the calculation right. If I add up the two eigenvalues, in this, if I add up the two eigenvalues for any matrix, and I'm going to do it for this one, I get what answer? I get the same answer from the adding, add the, add the lambdas, gives me the same answer as add the diagonal of the matrix, which I'm calling A. So if I add the diagonal, I get 0 and 0. Uh, so it's 0 plus 0. And this number adding the diagonal is called the trace. And we'll see it again because it's so simple. Just adding the diagonal entries gives you a, a key bit of information. When you add down the diagonal, it tells you the sum of the eigenvalues, sum of the lambdas. Doesn't tell you each lambda separately, but it tells you the sum. So it tells you one fact by doing one thing. Yeah, that, that's pretty handy. Gives you a quick check if you've, you know, by when you compute this determinant and solve for lambda, the, the thing you, this is the way to compute eigenvalues by hand. Um, you could make a mistake because it's a quadratic formula for two by two, but uh, you can check by adding the two roots, do you get the same as the trace, zero plus zero. Well, there's one other check equally quick for two by two. So two by two is you really get them right. Two, what's the other check to, we add the eigenvalues, we get the trace. We multiply the eigenvalues, so we take, so, so now I'll multiply the lambdas. So then I get i times minus i. And that should equal, let's don't look yet. What should it equal? If I multiply the eigenvalues, I should get the determinant right, of a. So that's two handy checks. Add the eigenvalues for any size, three by three, four by four, but it's only two checks. So for two by two, it's kind of, you got it. Three by three, four by four, you could still have made an error and the two checks could potentially still work. Let's just check it out here. What's i times minus i? One, because it's minus i squared and that's plus one. And the determinant of that matrix is zero minus, is one, yeah, okay. So we got one. Good. Those are really the key facts about eigenvalues. Uh, but of course, the, they're not, it's not as simple as solving AX equal B to find them. Uh, but it's, if you follow through on this uh, idea of uh, similar matrices and uh, sort of chop down the off diagonal part, then sure enough, the eigenvalues got to show up. Okay, symmetric. Symmetric matrices, okay. So now we're gonna have symmetric 
And then we'll have the special, even better than symmetric, is symmetric positive definite. OK, symmetric, you told me the main facts, are the eigenvalues real, the eigenvectors orthogonal, And I guess, actually, uh, yeah. So I want to put, the, take, put those into math symbols instead of words. So uh, yeah, yeah. I guess, yeah, shall I just jump in? And the other, other thing hidden there, but, but very important is, there's a full set of eigenvectors. Even if some eigenvalues happen to be repeated, like the identity matrix, it's still got plenty of eigenvectors. So that's an added point that I've not made there. And I'll, I could prove those two statements, but why don't I ask you to accept them and go onward? What are we going to do with them? OK. And yeah, can, can you just like let's have an example? Uh, just to, to, uh, let me put it, an example here. Suppose S. Now I'm calling it S. Is zeros one and one. So that's symmetric. What are its eigenvalues? What are the eigenvalues of that symmetric matrix S? plus and minus 1. Well, if you propose two eigenvalues, I'll write them down, 1 and minus 1. And then what will I do to check them? Trace and determine it. OK, so are they, are, is it true that the eigenvalues are 1 and minus 1? OK, how do I check the trace? What is the trace of that matrix? 0, and what's the sum of the eigenvalues? 0. Good. What about determinant? What's the determinant of s? Minus 1. The product of the eigenvalues minus 1, so we've got it. OK. What are the eigenvectors? What vector can you multiply by and it doesn't change direction? In fact, it doesn't change at all. I'm looking for the eigenvector that's a steady state. 0, 1? I think it's 1, 1. Yeah, so here's the lambdas. And then the eigenvectors are, I think, 1, 1. Is that right? Yeah, sure. S, S is just a permutation here. It's just exchanging the two entries. So 1 and 1 won't change. And what, what's the other eigenvector? 1 and minus 1. And then I'm thinking, remembering about this similar stuff, I'm thinking that A S is similar to a matrix that just shows the eigenvalues. So S is similar to, I'm going to put in an M well, I'm going to connect S, that matrix, with the eigenvalue matrix, which has the eigenvalues. So here's my, everybody calls that matrix capital lambda, because everybody calls the eigenvalues little lambda. So the matrix that has them is called capital lambda. And I, my claim is that these guys are similar. That this matrix S that you're seeing up there, I believe there's an M. I believe there's an M. So that S, what did I put in here? So I'm following this pattern. I believe that there would be an M and an M inverse. So that this would mean that. And that's nice. First of all, it, it would confirm that the eigenvalues stay the same, which, which, which was certain to happen. 
And then it would also mean that I had got a diagonal matrix. And of course, that's a natural goal to get a diagonal matrix. So we might hope that the M that gets us there is like an important matrix. So do you see what I'm doing here? It, it comes under the heading of diagonalizing a matrix. I start with a matrix S. I find its eigenvalues. They go on to, into lambda. And I believe I can find an M so that uh, I see they're, they're similar. They have the same eigenvalues, 1 and minus 1, both sides. So uh, only remaining question is, what's M? What's the matrix that diagonalizes S? The, what have we got left to use? The eigenvectors. The matrix that, so can I put the M like over there? Uh, yeah, I'll put the, that M inverse is going to go over to the other side. Oh, it goes here, doesn't it? Well, I, was, I was like worried there. I, it didn't look good, but yeah. So, so uh, this is all going to be right if, if uh, this is what I'd like to have: S M equal M lambda. S M equal M lambda. That's diagonalizing a matrix. That's finding the M using the eigenvectors that produces a similar matrix lambda, which has the eigenvalues. That, that's, that's the great fact about um, diagonalizing. That's how you use, that's another way to say this is how the eigenvectors pay off. You put them into M, you take the similar matrix and it's nice and diagonal. And do you see that this will happen? S times, so M has the first eigenvector, and the second eigenvector. And I believe that the first eigenvector times the second, uh, and the second eigenvector, that's M again on this side. Now let me just write in the 1, 0, 0, minus 1. I believe this has got to be like confirming that we've done the thing right. Confirming that the eigenvectors work here. Could just like, please, make sense out of that last line. So when you see that last line, how, well, what do I mean to make sense out of it? What, I want to see that that's true. How do I see that? How do I do this? So what's the left side and what's the right side? So what if, if I multiply S by a couple of columns, what's the answer? SX1 and SX2. That's the beauty of matrix multiplication. If I multiply a matrix by another matrix, I can do it a column at a time. There, there are four great ways to multiply matrices. So this is another one, uh, a column at a time. So this left-hand side is SX1, SX2. I just do each column. And what about the right-hand side? I can do that multiplication. x1 minus x2, did somebody say? Death. Uh, no, I don't want, oh, x1, sorry, you said it right. OK. When you said x1 minus x2, I was subtracting. But you meant that that's the first column is x1, and the second column is minus x2. Correct. Sorry about that. And did we come out right? Yes. Because now I compare SX1 is lambda 1x1, SX2 is lambda 2x2, and I'm golden. So what was the point of this board? What did we learn? We learned, well, we kind of expected that the original S would be similar to the lambdas because they, the eigenvalues match. S has eigenvalues lambda, and this diagonal matrix certainly has eigenvalues 1 and minus 1. A diagonal matrix, the eigenvalues are right in front of you. 
So they're similar. S is similar to the lambda. And there should be an M. And then somebody suggested maybe the M is the eigenvectors. And that's the right answer. So finally, let me write that conclusion here which isn't just for symmetric matrices. So maybe I should put it for matrix A. So if it has lambdas and eigenvectors, and the claim is that A times the eigenvector matrix is the eigenvector matrix times the eigenvalues. And I would shorten that to A x equals x lambda. And I could rewrite that, and then I'll slow down, as A equal x lambda x inverse. Really, this is bringing it all together in a simple, small formula. It's telling us that A is similar to lambda. It's telling us the matrix M that does the job. It's the matrix of eigenvectors. And uh, so it's like a shorthand way to write, what, write the main facts about eigenvalues and eigenvectors. What about A squared? Can I go back to the very first? I see time is close to the end here. What about A squared? What are the eigenvectors of A squared? What are the eigenvalues of A squared? That's like the whole point of eigenvalues. Well, or I could just square that stupid thing. X lambda x inverse, x lambda x inverse. And what have I got? x inverse x in the middle is identity. So I have x lambda squared, x inverse. And to me, that, and to you, that says the eigenvalues have been squared. The eigenvectors didn't change. Yeah. OK, and now finally, last breath is, what if the matrix is symmetric? Then we have different letters. That's the only. That's a significant change. The eigenvector matrix is now an orthogonal matrix. I'm coming back to the key facts of what makes symmetric. How do I read, how do I see symmetric helping me in the eigenvector and eigenvalue world? Well, it tells me that the eigenvectors are orthogonal. So the x is q. The eigenvalues are real, and the eigenvectors is x inverse. But now I'm going to make those eigenvectors unit vectors. I'm going to normalize it. So, uh, so I'm really allowing, I have an orthogonal matrix Q. So I have a different way to write this, and this is the end of the, today's class. Q, lambda, and what's, what can you tell me about Q inverse? It's Q transpose, thanks. So that was the last lecture. So now the orthogonal lecture is coming up at the last second of the symmetric matrices lecture. And this has the name spectral theorem, which I'll just put there. And the whole point is that uh, every, it tells you what every symmetric matrix looks like. Orthogonal eigenvectors, real eigenvalues. The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. OK, let me make a start. Um, on the left, you see the topic for today. So we're doing pretty well. This completes my sort of review of the highlights of linear algebra. 
So that is five lectures. And it, I'll, I'll follow up on those five points because the, the neat part is it really ties together the whole subject. Eigenvalues, energy, uh, A transpose A, determinants, pivots. Uh, they all come together. Each one gives a test for a positive definite matrices. So I'll, that's where I'm going. Uh, Claire uh, is hoping to come in for a, a little bit of the class to, to ask if anybody has started on the, on the homework and got Julia rolling and uh, got a yes from the auto grader. Did anybody, is anybody like? No. <laughs> You're taking a chance, right? Uh, Julia, in principle, works. But in, in practice, it's always an adventure the first time. So we chose this uh, lab on convolution because it was the first lab last time, last year. And it doesn't ask for much math at all. Really, you're just creating a matrix and getting the auto grader to say, yes, that's the right matrix. So, uh, 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 and we'll see that matrix. We'll see this idea of convolution in the right at the right time, which is not that far off. It's uh, signal processing, and it's early in uh, part three of the book. OK, so that, if Claire comes in, she'll answer questions. Otherwise, I guess it would be emailing questions to, uh, uh, I realize that the deadline is not on top of you. So, and you've got a whole weekend to make Julia fly. All right. So I'll, I'll start on the math then. We had symmetric matrices, eigenvalues of matrices and especially symmetric matrices. And those have real eigenvalues and I'll quickly show why, and orthogonal eigenvectors, and I'll quickly show why. But I want to move to the new idea, positive definite matrices. So these are the best of the symmetric matrices. They are symmetric matrices that have positive eigenvalues. That's the easy way to remember positive definite matrices. They have positive eigenvalues. But it's certainly not the easy way to test. If I give you a matrix like that, well, that's only two by two. We could actually find the eigenvalues. But we would like to have other tests, easier tests, which would be, which would be equivalent to positive eigenvalues. So these other, every one of those five tests, any one of those five tests is, is all you need. So let me just start with that example and ask you to look, and then I'm going to discuss those five separate points. But can you see, well, my question is, is that matrix S, it's obviously symmetric, is it positive definite or not? OK, so you could compute its eigenvalues since it's 2 by 2, its energy. I'll come back to that, because that's the most important one. Number two is really fundamental. Number three would ask you to factor that. Well, that's, you don't want to take time with that. Well, what do you think? Is it positive definite or not? I see an uh, expert in the front row saying no. And why is it no? The answer is no. That's not a positive definite matrix. Where does it let us down? It's got all positive numbers, but that's not what we're asking. We're asking positive eigenvalues, positive determinants, positive pivots. So what, how does it let us down? Where, where, which, which is the easy test to see that it fails? Maybe determinant. determinant. The determinant is 15 minus 16, so negative. And that's what, so how is the determinant connected to the eigenvalues? Everybody? Yep. Product. It's the product. So the two eigenvalues of S, they're real, of course. And they multiply to give the determinant, which is minus 1. So one of them is negative and one of them is positive. Th this matrix is an indefinite matrix, indefinite. So how could I make it 
positive definite. Okay, just we can just play with an example, and then we see these things happening. Uh, let's see. Okay, what, what shall I put in place of the five? For example, I could lower the four, or I can up the five, or up the three. I can make the diagonal entries. If I add stuff to the main diagonal, I'm making it more positive. Uh, so that's the sort of straightforward way. So what number in there would be safe? Six. Six. OK, six would be safe. If I go up from five to six, I've got to do that. So when I say here, leading determinants, what does that mean? That, so that's a, that word leading means something. It means that I take the one by one determinant. It would have to pass that. Just the determinant itself would not do it. Let me give you an example. Uh, no for, let me take, minus 3 and minus 6. That would have the same determinant. But it's, right, the determinant would still be 18 minus 16, 2. But it, it fails the test on the, on the one by one. And this passes. This passes the one by one test and the two by two test. So that's what this means here. Leading determinants are from the upper left. You have to check n things because you've got n eigenvalues. And those are the n tests, right? And have you noticed the connection to pivots? So let's just remember that small item. Uh, what would be the pivots? because we didn't take a long time on elimination. So what would be the pivots for, for that matrix, 3, 4, 4, 6? Well, what's the first pivot? 3, sitting there. The 1, 1 entry would be the first pivot. So the pivots would be 3. And what's the second pivot? Well, maybe to see it clearly, you want me to take that elimination step. Why don't I do it? just so you'll see it here. So elimination would subtract some multiple of row 1 from row 2. I, I would leave row 1 alone. I would subtract some multiple to get a 0 there. And what, what's the multiple? What's the multiplier in that one? 4 thirds. 4 thirds times row 1 away from row 2 would produce that 0. But 4 thirds times the 4, that would be 16 thirds, and we're uh, subtracting it from 18 thirds. I think we've got two thirds left. So the pivots, which is this in elimination, are the three and the two thirds, and of course they're positive. And actually, you see the immediate connection. This pivot is the two by two determinant divided by the one by one determinant. The 2 by 2, two determinant, we figured out 18 minus, four, minus 16 was 2. The 1 by 1 determinant is 3. And sure enough, that second pivot is 2 thirds. This is not uh, uh, so I'm, I'm, by example, I'm illustrating what these uh, different tests and again, each test is all you need. If it passes one test, it passes them all. And, and we haven't found the eigenvalues. Let me do the energy. Can I do energy here? OK, so what's this? I, 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 I'm saying that this is the, really the great test. That, for me, that's the definition of a positive definite matrix. And the word energy comes in because it's quadratic, the way kinetic energy or potential energy. So that's the energy in the vector x for this matrix. So let me compute it, x transpose sx. So let me put in s here, the original s. And let me put in any vector x, so say xy or x1, maybe. Do you like x, xy is easier. So that's, that's our vector x, transpose. This is our matrix S. 
and here's our vector x. So it's a function of x and y. It's a pure quadratic function. Can you, do you know what I get when I multiply that out? I get, I get a very simple, important type of function. Um, shall we multiply it out? Um, let's see, shall I multiply that by that first? So I get 3x plus 4y and 4x plus 6y is what I'm getting from the, these two. And now I'm hitting that with the xy. And now I'm going to see the energy. And you'll see the pattern. That's always what math is about. What's the pattern? So I have x times 3x, 3x squared. And I have y times 6y, that's 6y squared. And I have x times 4y, that's 4xy's. And I have y times 4x, that's 4 more xy's. So I've got all those terms. Every, every term in the, every number in the matrix gives me a piece of the energy. And you see that the diagonal numbers, 3 and 6, those give me the diagonal pieces, 3x squared and 6y squared. And then the cross, what I maybe call them the cross terms, those give me 4xy and 4xy, so really 8xy. So, so you could call this thing 8xy. So that's my function. That's my quadratic. That's my energy. And I believe that that is greater than 0. Let me graph the thing. Let me graph that energy. OK, so here's a graph of my function f of x and y. Here's x and here's y. And of course, that's on the graph, 0, 0. At x equals 0, y equals 0, the function is clearly 0. Everybody's got his eye. Let me write that function again here. 3x squared, 6y squared, 8xy. Actually, you can see this is how I think about that, that uh, function. So 3x squared is obviously carrying me upwards. It's, a, it's not, it'll never go negative. 6y squared will never go negative. 8xy can go negative, right? If x and y have opposite signs, that, that'll go negative. But the question is, do these, do these positive pieces overwhelm it and make the graph go up like a bowl? And the answer is yes for a positive definite matrix. So this is a graph of a positive definite matrix, of, of, a, of, of a positive energy, the energy of a positive definite matrix. So this is the energy x transpose s x that I'm graphing. And, and there it is. This is important. This is important. This is the kind of function we like, x transpose s x where s is positive definite. Uh, so the function goes up like that. This is what deep learning is about. This could be a loss function that you, that you minimize. It could depend on 100,000 variables or more. And uh, it could come from the, the error in the difference between uh, training data and your and the, and the uh, number you get. It, the loss would be some expression like that. Well, I'll make sense of those words as soon as I can. What I want to say is uh, deep learning, neural nets, machine learning, the, the big computation is to minimize an energy is to minimize an energy. Now, of course, I made the minimum easy to find because I have pure squares. Well, that doesn't happen in practice, of course. In practice, we have uh, linear terms, x transpose b, or nonlinear, 
yeah, the loss function doesn't have to be a, a thing, cross entropy, all kinds of things. There, there's a whole dictionary of possible loss functions. But, but this is the model. This is the model, and I'll make it the perfect model by just focusing on, the, on that part. Well, uh, yeah. By the way, what 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 would cre what would happen if that was in there? I shouldn't have X'd it out so so well so quickly since I just put it up there. Let me put it back up. I thought better of it. Okay, this is a kind of least squares problem with some data B. Minimize that. So what would be the graph of this guy? Can I just draw the same? sort of picture uh, for that function. Will it be a bowl? Yes. If I have this term, all that does is move it off center here. At x equals 0, well, I still get 0. Sorry, I still go through that point. If, if this is the 0 vector, I'm still getting 0. But this will bring it below. That would. That would produce a bowl like that. Actually, it would just be the same bowl. The bowl is, would just be shifted. I could write that to, to show how that happens. So this is, this is now below 0. This is the, that's the uh, solution we're after that tells us the weights uh, in the neural network. I'm just using these words, but we'll soon have a meaning to them. I want to find that minimum, in other words. And I want to find it for much more complicated functions than that. Of course, if I minimize a quadratic, that means setting derivatives to 0. I just have linear equations. Probably I, can, I could write everything down for that, for that thing. So let's put in some nonlinear stuff, which which wiggles the bowl, makes it not so easy. Can, can I look a month ahead? How do you find, so this is a big part of mathematics, applied math, optimization, minimization of a complicated function of 100,000 variables. That's the biggest computation. That's the reason machine learning on big problems takes a week. On a, on a GPU or multiple GPUs because you have so many unknowns. Uh, more than 100,000 would be quite normal. In general, let, let's just have the pleasure of looking ahead for one minute and then I'll come back to r real life here, linear algebra. Uh, just, I can't resist uh, thinking aloud, how do you find the minimum? By the way, these functions, both of them, are convex. So that is convex. So I want to connect convex functions f. And what does convex mean? It means, well, that the graph is like that. <laughs> yeah, I mean. <laughs> Not perfect, it, it, could, it could, but if, if it's a quadratic, then convex means uh, positive definite, or maybe in the, at the extreme positive semi-definite, I'll have to mention that, yeah. But, but uh, convex means it goes up, but it could have wiggles. It doesn't have to be just uh, perfect squares and linear terms, but general things, and for, for deep learning, it will include uh, none. It'll go far beyond quadratics, but, well, it may not be convex, I guess. That's also true. Yeah, so, let, so deep learning has got serious problems, because those functions, they may look like this, but then over here, they could go, you know, non-convex. They could dip down a little more, and you're looking for this point or for this point. Still, I'm determined to tell you how to find it, uh, so, or, or a start on how you find it. So you're at some point. There, right, start, start there. 
somewhere on the surface. Some x, some, some vector x is your start, x0. Starting with. And we're going to just take a step, hopefully down, down the bowl. Well, of course, it would be fantastic to, take, to get there in one step, but that's not going to happen. That's, that would be solving a big linear system very expensive and a big nonlinear system. So really, that's what we're trying to solve, a big nonlinear system. And I should be like on this picture because here we can see where the minimum is, but it just shifts. So what would you do if you had a starting point and you wanted to go look for the minimum? What, what's the natural idea? Compute derivatives. You've got calculus on your side. Compute the first derivatives. So the first derivatives of, with respect to x, so, so I would compute the derivative of f with respect to x and the derivative of f with respect to y and 100,000 more. And that takes a little while. And now I've got the derivatives. What do I do? Go down. I go. That tells me the steepest direction. That tells me at that point which way is fastest way down. So I would follow. I would do a gradient descent. I would follow that gradient. This is called the gradient. All the first derivatives is called the gradient of f. The gradient. gradient vector. It's a vector, of course, because f is a function of lots of variables. I would start down in that direction. And how far to go? That's like the million dollar question in, in deep learning. It's when, it, is it, is it going to hit zero? Nope, it's not. It's not. And the, so, you, basically, you, you go down until it, until to go, f in, so you're traveling here in the x along the gradient, and you're, you're, you're not aim, you're not going to hit zero. You're, you're all going here in some direction, and you want to go, so you keep going down this thing until it, oh my, I'm not Rembrandt here. Uh, I'm the, your path down, think of yourself on a mountain. You're trying to go downhill. So you take as fast as you can. So you take the steepest route down until, but, but, but you have blinkers on. You just, once you decide on a direction, you go in that direction. Of course, yeah. So, so what will happen? You'll go down for a while and then it will turn up again, right? When you get sort of maybe close to the bottom or maybe not, you're, you're not going to hit here and it's going to miss that and come up. Maybe I should draw it over here, whatever. So this is, a, it's called a line search to, to decide how far to go there and then say, okay, stop. And you can invest a lot of time or a little time to decide on that first stopping point. And now, just tell me, what do you do next? So now you're here. What, what now? Recalculate the gradient. Find the steepest way down from that point. Follow it until it turns up, or approximately. Then you're at a new point. So this is gradient descent. That's gradient descent, the big algorithm of deep learning of neural nets, of, of machine learning, great, or of optimization, you could say. Notice that we didn't compute second derivatives. If, if we computed second derivatives, we could have a fancier formula that could account for the bending, the, the, the curve here. But to compute second derivatives when you've got hundreds of thousands of variables is, is not a lot of fun. So most uh, um, uh, effectively, uh, machine learning is limited to first derivatives, the gradient. Uh, so, uh, okay, so that's the general idea. 
but there are lots and lots of uh, uh, decisions and uh, why doesn't that, how, how well does that work? Maybe, maybe is a good way to, good question to ask. Does this work pretty well? It, you know, or do we have to add more ideas? Well, it doesn't always work well. Let me tell you what the trouble is. I don't, so I'm way, way off, I'm like, this is, this is like March or something. Uh, but anyway, I'll finish the sentence. Uh, so what, what's the problem with this gradient descent idea? It, it turns out if you're going down a narrow valley, I don't know if you can sort of imagine a narrow valley toward the bottom. So, so here's, here's, the, here's the bottom. Here's your starting point, and this is, so I'm in, you have to think of this as a bowl. So the, yeah, the bowl is, or the two eigenvalues you could say are one and a very small number. The bowl is long and thin. Are you with me? Imagine a long, thin bowl. Then what happens for that case? You, you take steepest descent, but you cross the valley and very soon you're climbing again. So you take very, it's very small steps, just staggering back and forth across this and getting slowly, but too slowly toward the bottom. So that's why things have got to be uh, improved. You can't, if you have, eigenvalue, a very small eigenvalue and a very large eigenvalue, those give, tell you the, the, the shape of the bowl, of course, and uh, many cases will, will be like that, have a small and a large eigenvalue, and then you're spending all your time, you're quickly going up the other side, down, up, down, up, down, and uh, you need a new idea. Okay. So that's really, so this is one major reason why positive definite is so important because positive definite gives pictures like that. But then we have this question of are the eigenvalues sort of the same size? Of course, if the eigenvalues are all equal, what's my bowl like? Suppose, suppose, all the, suppose I have the identity. So that's x squared plus y squared is my function then it's a perfectly circular bowl. What will happen if I, can you imagine a perfectly circular, like any, any bowl in the kitchen is probably most likely circular. Uh, and suppose I do gradient descent there. I start at some point on this round, perfectly circular bowl. I start down and where do I stop in that case? Do I hit bottom? I do. By symmetry, I'm going to, so, so if I take x squared plus y squared as my function and I start somewhere, I figure out the gradient. Yeah, and the answer is I'll go right through the center. So really it's uh, positive, de positive eigenvalues, positive definite matrices give us a bowl, but if the eigenvalues are far apart, that's when we have problems. Okay, I'm going back to my job, uh, which is this, this stuff. Because you really, this is so nice, yeah, right. Could you, uh, well, the homework uh, that's maybe going out this minute, um, for middle of next week, it gives you some exercises with this. Let, let, let me um, do a couple of things, a couple of exercises here. Uh, for example, suppose I have a positive definite matrix S and a positive definite matrix T. If I add those matrices, is the result positive definite? So there's a perfect math question, and we hope to answer it. Okay. 
So S and T, positive definite. What about S plus T? Is that matrix positive definite? OK. How do I answer such a question? I look at my five tests and I think, can I use it? What, which one will be good? And, the, uh, and one that won't tell me much is the eigenvalues, because the eigenvalues of S plus T are not immediately clear from the eigenvalues of S and T separately. I don't want to use that test. Uh, this is my favorite test, so I'm going to use that. What about the energy in, so look at the energy. So I look at x transpose, s plus t, x. And what's my question in my mind here? Is that a positive number or not for, for every x? And how am I going to answer that question? Just separate those two into two pieces. Right, it's there in front of me. It's, it's this one plus this one. And both of those are positive, so the answer is yes. It is positive definite, yes. You see how the energy just was right. I don't want to compute the pivots or any determinants. That would be like a nightmare trying to find the determinants for s plus t, but this one just does it immediately. What else would be a good example to start with? What about s inverse? Is that positive definite? So let me ask s positive definite, and I want to ask about its inverse. So its inverse is a symmetric matrix, and uh, is it positive definite? And the answer, yes, yes. I got five tests, 20% chance of picking the right one. Uh, determinants, not good. The first one is great. The first one is the good one for this question because the eigenvalue, so the answer is yes, is yes, this is, has, Eigenvalues. So, what are the eigenvalues of S inverse? One over lambda. So, yes, positive definite. Positive definite. Okay. Right. Um, yep. Uh, what about? Yeah. Let me ask just one more question of this same sort. Uh, suppose I have a matrix S, and suppose I multiply it by uh, another matrix. Oh, well, okay. Suppose, yeah. Yeah. Do I want to ask you this? Suppose I have S, suppose I asked you about S times another matrix, M. Would that be positive definite or not? Now, I'm going to tell you the, an the answer is that the question wasn't any good because that matrix is probably not symmetric. And I'm only dealing with symmetric matrices. Matrices have to be symmetric before I, can, before I know they have real eigenvalues and I can ask these questions. So that's not good, but I could Oh, let's see. Oh, well, let me hear. Yeah, let me, let me put in an orthogonal guy. Well, it's still that's not symmetric, but if I put the, it's transpose over there, then I made it symmetric. Oh, dear, I may be getting myself in trouble here. Uh, so I'm starting with a positive definite S. I'm hitting with an orthogonal matrix and it's transpose, and I sort of, my instinct, carried me here because I know that that's still symmetric, right? Everybody sees that? If I transpose this, Q transpose will come here, S, Q will go there, it'll be some check symmetric. Now, is that positive definite? 
Ah, oh, yes, we can answer that. Uh, can we? Is that positive definite? So remember that this is an orthogonal matrix, so I'm also, if you wanted me to write it that way, I could. And what about positive definiteness of that thing? Um, the answer, I think, is yes. Do you agree? It is positive definite. What, give me a reason, though. Why, why is this positive definite? Be, so that word similar. So what? this is a similar matrix to S. Do you remember what similar means from last time? It means that some M and its inverse are here, which they are. And so what's the... What's the consequence of being similar? What do I know about a matrix that's similar to S? It has the same, same eigenvalues, and therefore, we're good, right? Or I could go this way. I could, uh, energy, I, I like energy, so let me try that one. X transpose, Q transpose, S, Q, X, that would be the energy. And what am I trying to show? I'm trying to show it's positive. So, of course, my, as soon as I see that, like, just waiting for me to let QX be something called Y, maybe, and then what will this be? Y, y transpose. So this, this energy would be the same as Y transpose S, Y, and what do I know about that? It's positive, because that's an energy in the Y, for the Y vector. So one way or another, we, we get the answer yes to that question. Okay, okay. Um, let me... introduce the idea of semi-definite. Semi-definite is the borderline. So, so what did we have? We had three, four, four, and then when it was five, you told me indefinite, a negative eigenvalue. When it was six, you told me two positive eigenvalues, definite. What's the borderline? What's the borderline there? It's not, it's not going to be an integer, but it's, what, what do I mean? What am I looking for at the borderline? Uh, well, yeah, so tell me again. 16 over 3. 16 over 3, that sounds right. Why is that the borderline? Because now the determinant is zero. zero. It's singular. It has a zero eigenvalue. There's a zero eigenvalue. So that's what semi-definite means. Lambdas are greater or equal to zero. Wait a minute. That has a zero eigenvalue, because it's determined as zero. How do I know that the other eigenvalue is positive? Could, could, the, uh, could it be that the other eigenvalue? So this is the semi-definite case, we hope. But we better finish that uh, reasoning. How do I know that the other eigenvalue is positive? Trace. The trace. Because the adding 3 plus 16 over 3, whatever the heck that might give, it certainly gives a positive number. And that will be lambda 1 plus lambda 2. That's the trace. But lambda 2 is 0. We know from this, it's singular, so we know lambda 2 is 0. So lambda 1 must be 3 plus 5. Five and a third must lambda. The lambdas must be eight and a third, three plus five and a third, and zero. Yeah. So that's a positive semi-definite. Oh, if you think of the positive definite matrices as some clump in uh, matrix space, then the positive semi-definite ones are sort of the edge of that. Clump. They're the boundary of the clump, the ones that are not quite inside, but not outside either. They're, they're lying right on the edge of positive definite matrices. Uh, let me just take a...
So what about what about a matrix of all ones? What's the what's the story on that one? Positive definite, all the numbers are positive, or positive semi definite or indefinite? What, what do you think here? One one all ones. Semi. Semi definite sounds like a good guess. Do you know what the eigenvalues of this matrix would be? Zero. Three, zero, and one. Three, zero, and zero. Why did you say that? It's too literally keeping the columns. Because we only have the rank is one. one. Wow. Yeah, we got to introduce that keyword. The rank is one. So there's only one non-zero eigenvalue. And then the trace tells me it's th that that number is three. So this is a positive positive semi-definite matrix. So, so all, these, all these tests change a little for semi-definite. The eigenvalue is greater or equal to zero. The energy is greater or equal to zero. The A transpose A, but now I don't require, oh, I didn't discuss this, but, but semi-definite would allow dependent columns. By the way, You've got to do this for me. Write that matrix as A transpose times A, just to see that it's semi-definite because. Uh, so write that as A transpose A. Uh, yeah? If it's a rank one matrix, you know how, what it must look like. A transpose A, how many terms am I going to have in, in this? Uh, and now I'm thinking back to the very beginning of this course. If I pulled off the pieces, in, in general, this is lambda 1 times the first eigenvector times the first eigenvector transpose. Wouldn't A just be a vector of three ones? Yeah, it would just be a vector of three ones. Yeah, so so... This would be the usual picture. That, this is the same as the Q lambda Q transpose. This is, this is the big, big fact for any symmetric matrix. And this is symmetric. But its rank is only 1. So that, so that lambda 2 is 0 for that matrix. Lambda 3 is 0 for that matrix. And, and the one eigenvector is the vector 1, 1, 1. And the eigen, so this would be 3 times 1, 1, 1. Oh, I have to do. Yeah. So I was going to do 3 times 1, 1, 1 times 1, 1, 1. But that gives me 3, 3, 3. That's not right. Normalize them. I have to normalize them. That's right. Yeah, so that's a vector of whose length is square root of 3, so I have to divide by that, and I have to divide by it, and then the 3 cancels the square root of 3s, and I'm just left with the 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, yeah, that you propose. Yeah. So there is a matrix, one of our building block type matrices, because it only has one non-zero eigenvalue. Its rank is 1. So it could not be positive definite. It's, it's, it's singular. But it is positive semi-definite because that eigenvalue is positive. OK. Uh, so you got the idea of uh, positive definite matrices. Again, all five of those, any one of those five tests is enough to show that it's positive definite. and. Uh, so what's my goal next week is the singular value decomposition and all that that leads us to. That's, that's we're, we're there now, ready for um, at the SVD. OK, have a good weekend and see you. Oh, I see you on Tuesday, I guess, right? Not Monday, but Tuesday uh, next week. The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free.
To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. So this is a big day, mathematically speaking, because we come to this key uh, idea, uh, which is a little bit like eigenvalues, well, a lot like eigenvalues, but different because the matrix A now is uh, more usually rectangular. So for a rectangular matrix, the whole idea of eigenvalues is shot because if I multiply A times a vector x in n dimensions, out will come something in m dimensions, and it's not going to equal lambda x. So ax equal lambda x is not even possible if a is rectangular. And even if A is square, what are the problems? Just thinking for a minute about eigenvalues. The, the case I wrote up here is the great case where I have a symmetric matrix, and then it's got a full set of eigenvalues and eigenvectors, and they're orthogonal, all good. But for a general square matrix, either the eigenvectors are complex, eigenvalues are complex, or the eigenvectors are not orthogonal. So, uh, so we, we can't stay with eigenvalues forever. That's what I'm saying. And this is the right thing to do. A is, no. So what are these pieces? So these are the left and these are the right singular vectors. So this is the, the new word is singular. And in between go the, not the eigenvalues, but the singular values. So that, so we've got the whole point now, you got to pick up on this. There are two sets of singular vectors, not one. For eigenvectors, we just had one set, the Q's. Uh, now we have, for a rectangular matrix, we've got one set of left eigenvectors in, in uh, m dimensions, and we've got another set of right eigenvectors in n dimensions. And uh, numbers in between are not eigenvalues, but singular values. So these guys are, let me write what that looks like. This is again a diagonal matrix sigma 2 to sigma r, let's say. So it's again a diagonal matrix in the middle, but uh, the numbers on the diagonal are all positive, or zero, and they're called singular values. So it's just a different world. Okay, so really the first step I have to do, the math step, is to show that any matrix has, can be factored into U times sigma times V transpose. So that's the, that, that's the parallel to the spectral theorem that any symmetric matrix could be factored that way. So you're good for that part. We'll, we'll have to, we just have to do it to see what are U and sigma and V. What are those vectors and those singular values? Okay, let's go. So the key is that A transpose A is, is a great matrix. So that's the key, that's the key to the math is A transpose A. So what are the properties of A transpose A? This is, A is rectangular again, so maybe M by N. A transpose is, so this was m by n, and this was n by m. So we get a result that's n by n. And what else can you tell me about A transpose A? It's symmetric. It's symmetric. That's a big deal. And it's square, and well, oh yeah, you can tell me more now, because we talked about uh, something, a topic that's a little more than symmetric last time. It, the matrix A transpose A will be positive definite. Its eigenvalues are 
greater or equal to zero. And that will mean that we can take their square roots. And that's what we will do. So A transpose A will have a factorization. It's symmetric. It, it, it'll have a like a Q lambda Q transpose. But I'm going to call it V lambda. No, yeah, lambda. I'll still call it lambda V transpose. So these V's, what do we know about the eigenvectors? So these V's are eigenvectors of this guy. Square, symmetric, positive definite matrix. So we're in good shape. And what do we know about the eigenvalues of, of A transpose A? They are all positive. So the, the eigenvalues are, well, are equal to zero. And these guys are orthogonal. And these guys are greater or equal to zero. And OK. So that's good. That's one of our, that's a, we'll depend a lot on that. But also, you got to recognize that A, A transpose is a different, different guy. A, A transpose. So, so what, what's, what's the shape of A, A transpose? How big is that? Now I've got, what do I have? M by N times N by M. So this will be what size? M by M, different shape, but with the same eigenvalue. The same eigenvalues. So it's going to have some other eigenvectors. U, of course, I'm going to call them U because I'm going to go in over there. They'll be the same. Well, the same. Yeah, let me. I shouldn't. I, I have to say, when I say the same, I can't quite literally mean the very same because this has got n eigenvalues and this has got m eigenvalues. But the, the, the missing guys, the ones that are in one of them and not in the other, depending on the sizes, are zeros. So really, the heart of the thing, the non-zero eigenvalues, are the same. OK. Now, well, actually, I've pretty much revealed what the SVD is going to use. It's going to use the U's from here and the V's from here. But that's, uh, that's the story. You've got to see that story. OK. So fresh start on the singular value decomposition. What are we looking for? Well, as a factorization, so we're looking for we want A, we want vectors V. So that when I multiply by v, so if it was an eigenvector, it would be a v equal lambda v. But now for a, it's rectangular. It's not, it hasn't got eigenvectors. So a v is sigma, the, the new singular value, times u. That's the first guy and the second guy and the r guy. I'll stop at r. The rank, oh yeah. Is that what I want? A. Let me just see. A v is sigma u. Yeah, that's good. Okay. So this is what takes the place of a x equal lambda x. A times one set of singular vectors gives me a number times the other set of singular vectors. And why did I stop at r, the rank? Because after that, the sigmas are 0. So after that, I could have some more guys, but they'll be in the null space, 0, on down to uh, vn. So these are the important ones. So that's what I'm looking for. Can I, let me say it now in words. I'm looking for a bunch of orthogonal vectors, v, so that when I multiply them by a, I get a bunch of orthogonal vectors, u. That is not so clearly possible. But it, it, is, it is possible. It does happen. I'm looking for one set of orthogonal vectors, v, in the input space, you could say, so that the a v's in the output space are also orthogonal. In, in our picture of uh, 
in our picture of the fundamental, the, the big picture of linear algebra, we have v's in this space, and then stuff in the null space. And we have u's over here in the column space, and some stuff in the null space over there. And the idea is that I have orthogonal v's here. And when I multiply by a, so multiply by a, then I get orthogonal u's over here. Orthogonal to orthogonal. That's what, the, that's what makes the v's and the u's special. Right. OK, that's, that's the property. And then when we write down, well, let me write down what that would mean. What, so I've just drawn a picture to go with this, those equations. That picture just goes with these equations. And let me just write down what it means. It means in, in matrix, so I've written it, oh, yeah, I've written it here in vectors one at a time. But of course, you know, I'm going to put those vectors into the columns of a matrix. So A times V1 up to let's say vr will equal, uh, oh, yeah, it equals sigmas times u's. So this is what I'm after, is u1 up to ur multiplied by sigma1 along to sigma r. It, what I'm doing now is just to say I'm converting these individual singular vectors, each v going into a u, to putting them all together into a matrix. And of course, what I've written here is a v equals u sigma. a v equals u sigma. That's what that amounts to. Well, then I'm going to put a V transpose on this side, and I'm going to get to A equals U sigma V transpose, multiplying both sides there by V transpose. You, I'm kind of writing the same thing in different forms, matrix form, vector at a time form. Uh, and now we have to find them. Now, now I've, I've you used up boards saying what we're after, but now we got to get there. So what are the V's and what are the U's? Um, well, the cool idea is to think of A transpose A. So you're with me what we're for. And now think about A transpose A. So I, if this is what I'm hoping for, what will a transpose A turn out to be. So big moment that's going to reveal what the V's are. So if I form A transpose A, so A transpose, so I've got to transpose this guy. So A transpose is V sigma transpose U transpose, right? And then comes A, which is this u sigma v transpose. So why did I do that? Why is it that a transpose a is the cool thing to look at to make the problem simpler? Well, what, what, make, what becomes simpler in that line just written? u transpose u is the identity, because I'm looking for orthogonal, in fact, orthonormal u's. So that's the identity. So this is V sigma transpose sigma V transpose. And I'll put parentheses around that because that's a diagonal matrix. OK. What does that tell me? What does that tell all of us? A transpose A has this form. Now, we've seen that form before. We know that this is a. Symmetric matrix, symmetric and even positive definite. So what are the V's? The V's are the eigenvectors of 
A transpose A. Here, we're, this is the Q lambda Q transpose for that symmetric matrix. So we know the V's are the eigenvectors, V's the eigenvectors of A transpose A. And I guess we're also going to get the, the singular values, so the sigma transpose sigma, which will be the sigma squareds, are the eigenvalues of A transpose A. Good. Sort of by looking for the correct thing, U sigma V transpose, and then just using the U transpose U equal identity, we got it back to something we, we perfectly recognize. A transpose A has that form, so now we know what the V's are. And if I do it the other way, which, what's the other way? Instead of A transpose A, the other way is to look at AA transpose. And if I write all that down, the A is the U sigma V transpose, and the A transpose is the V sigma transpose, U transpose. And again, this stuff goes away and leaves me with U sigma, sigma, sigma transpose, U transpose. So I know what the U's are, too. They're the eigenvectors of AA transpose. Isn't that a beautiful symmetry? You just A transpose A and AA transpose are two different guys now, so they have each has its own eigenvectors, and we use both. It's just right. And I just have to take the final step, and, and we've uh, established the SVD. So the final step is to remember what I'm going for here. A times a V is supposed to be sigma times a U. See, what, I'm, what I have to deal with now is, is I haven't quite finished. It, it, it's just perfect as far as it goes, but it hasn't gone to the end yet. Because we could have double eigenvalues and triple eigenvalues and all those horrible possibilities. And if I have triple eigenvalues or double eigenvalues, then what, what's the deal with eigenvectors if I have double eigenvalues? Suppose a matrix has a say a symmetric matrix has a double eigenvalue. Let me just take an example. So symmetric matrix like, say, 1, 1, 5. Make it. Why not? What's the deal with eigenvectors for that matrix 1, 1, 5? So 5 has got an eigenvector. You can see what it is, 0, 0, 1. What about the eigenvectors that go with lambda equal 1 for that matrix. What's up? What, I, what, what would be eigenvectors for lambda equal 1? Unfortunately, there's a whole plane of them. Any vector of the, for, of the form x, y, 0, any, any, any vector in the x, y plane would produce x, y, 0. So I have a whole plane of eigenvectors, and I've got to pick two that are orthogonal, which I can do. And then they have to be in the, in the SVD, those two orthogonal guys have to go to two orthogonal guys. In other words, there's a little bit of like detail here, a little getting into this exactly what is, well, actually. Let me, let me tell you the steps. OK. So I use this to conclude that, that the v's, the singular vectors, should be eigenvalues. I concluded those guys from this step. Now, I'm not going to use this step so much. Of course, it's in the back of my mind, but I'm not using it. I, I'm going to get the u's from here. So u1 is a v1 over sigma 1. v ur 
is A V R over sigma R. Do you see what I'm doing here? I'm picking in a possible plane of things the one I want, the U's I want. So I've chosen the V's, I've chosen the sigmas. They were they are fixed for A transpose A. The eigenvectors are V's. The things the eigenvalues are sigma squareds. Okay. And now, then, this is the U I want. Are, are you with me? So I had to, I had to give. A, I, I want to get these U's correct, and if I have a whole plane of possibilities, I got to pick the right one. Okay, and now finally, I have to show that it's the right one. So what is left to show? I would, I should show that these U's are eigenvectors of A A transpose. And I should show that they're orthogonal, right? That's the key, right? I, ha I would like to show that these are orthogonal. And that's what goes in this picture. The Vs, I've got orthogonal guys, because they're, they're the eigenvectors of a symmetric matrix. Pick them orthogonal. But now I'm multiplying by A, so I'm getting the U, which is A V over sigma for the basis vectors. And I have to show they're orthogonal. So th this is like the final moment. Does everything come together right? If I've picked the V's as the eigenvectors of A transpose A, and then I take these for the U's, are they orthogonal? So I, I would like to think that we can check that fact and it, that it will come out. Can, could you just help me through this one? I'll never ask for anything again. Just, <laughs> just, just get the SVD for me. Okay. So I would like to show that A, that U1, that's, so let me put up what I'm doing. I'm trying to show that U1 transpose u2 is 0. They're orthogonal. OK, so u1 is a v1 over sigma 1. That's transpose. That's u1. And u2 is a v2 over sigma 2. And I want to get 0. The, the whole conversation is, ended right, is ending right here. Why is that thing zero? The V's are orthogonal. We know the V's are orthogonal. They're orthogonal eigenvectors of A transpose A. Let me re repeat that. The V's are orthogonal eigenvectors of A transpose A, which I know they're, 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 we can find them. Then I chose the U's to be this, and I want to get the answer zero. Are you ready to do it? We want to, we want to uh, compute that and get zero. So what do I get? It's, we just have to do it. So I can see that the denominator is that. So is it V1 transpose A transpose, right, times A V2? And I'm hoping to get zero. Do I get zero here? You hope so. V1 is orthogonal to V2, but I've got A transpose A stick, stuck in the middle there. So what do I? What, do, what happens here? How do I look at that? V2 is an eigenvector of A transpose A. Terrific. So, so this is V1 transpose, and this is the matrix times V2. So that's sigma 2 transpose V2, isn't it? It's the eigenvector with eigenvalue sigma 2 squared times V2, yep, uh, divided by sigma 1 sigma 2.
So the A's are out of there now. And do I, so I've just got these numbers, sigma 2 squared, so that would be sigma 2 over sigma 1. Is, I've accounted for these numbers here times V1 transpose V2, and now what's up? They're orthonormal. We got it. That's zero. That is zero there. Yeah. So, so not only are the v's orthogonal to each other, but because they're eigenvectors of A transpose A, when I do this, I discover that the A v's are orthogonal to, to each other over in the, in the uh, column space. So orthogonal v's in the row space, orthogonal A v's over in the column space. So, uh, so that was discovered uh, late, much long after eigenvectors. And it's an interesting history. Uh, and it just comes out right. And then it was discovered, but not much used for, oh, 100 years probably. And then uh, people saw that it was exactly the right thing. And data matrices became important, which are large uh, rectangular matrices. And we have not, oh, I better say a word, just a word here about actually computing the v's and the sigmas and the u's. So how would you actually find them? You, what I most want to say is you would not go this A transpose A route. Why, why is it like a, a, a big mistake if you have a matrix A, say 5,000 by 10,000? Uh, why is it a mistake to actually use A transpose A in the computation? We used it big, heavily in the proof. And we could f find another proof that wouldn't use it so much. But why would I not, do, why would I not multiply these two together it's very big, very expensive. It, it adds in a whole lot of um, round off. It, it, you have a matrix that's now, t its vulnerability to round off errors is squared. That's called its condition number gets squared. And you just don't go there. So the actual computational methods are quite different. And we'll talk about those. But the, the A transpose A, because it's symmetric, positive, definite, made the proof so nice. That's, that's what you, you've seen the nicest proof, I'd say, of the. Uh, now, and now I should think about the geometry. So, so what does A equal, A equal U sigma? Maybe I take another board, but it's, it will fill it. But it's a good U sigma V transpose. I, so it's got three factors there. And I would like, and the, each factor is kind of a special matrix. U and V are orthogonal matrix, so I think of those as rotations. Sigma is a diagonal matrix. I think of it as stretching. So now I'm just going to draw the picture. So here's uh, unit vectors. And the first thing, so that if I multiply by x, this is the first thing that happens. So that rotates. This, here's, here's x's. Then v transpose x's, that, that's still a circle. Length didn't change for those when I multiply by an orthogonal matrix. But the vectors turned. It's a rotation. Could be a reflection, but let's keep it as a rotation. Now, what does sigma do? So I have this unit circle. These I'm in 2D. So I'm drawing a picture of the vectors. These are the unit vectors in 2D, x, y. They got turned by the orthogonal matrix. What, ha what does sigma do to that picture? 
it stretches because sigma multiplies by sigma 1 in the first component, sigma 2 in the second. So it stretches these guys. And say, let's suppose this is number 1 and this is number 2. This is number 1 and this is number 2. So sigma 1, our convention is sigma 1, we always take sigma 1 greater or equal sigma 2 greater or equal whatever greater or equal sigma rank, and that's, and that they're all positive, and the rest are zero. So sigma 1 will be bigger than sigma 2, so I'm expecting this ellipse, it'll change, a circle goes to an ellipse when you stretch the, the, I didn't get it quite perfect, but not bad. So this would, this would be sigma 2 v2, v, sigma 1 v1, and this would be sigma 2 v2, and we now have an ellipse. So we started with x's in a circle, we rotated, we stretched, and now the final step is take these guys and multiply them by u. So this was the sigma v transpose x. And now I'm ready for the u part, which comes last because it's at the left. And what happens, what's the picture now? What does u do to the ellipse? It rotates it. It's another orthogonal matrix. It rotates it somewhere, maybe there. And now we see the u's, u2 and u1. Do ah, maybe maybe they're there. Maybe I. Uh, well, let me let me think about that. Basically, that's not, that's right. So, so this SVD is telling us something qu quite remarkable, that every linear transformation, every matrix multiplication, factors into a rotation times a stretch times a different rotation, but possibly different. Actually, when would the u be the same as the v? Here's a good question. When, when is u the same as v? When are the two singular vectors just the same? A square. Because a would have to be square. And we want this to be the same as q lambda q transpose, if they're the same. So the u's would be the same as the v's when the matrix is symmetric. And actually, we need it to be positive definite. Why is that? Because our convention is these guys are greater or equal to zero. These guys, if, if, if it's going to be the same, then so for a positive definite symmetric matrix, the, the, uh, the, S, the S that we started with is the same as the, U, as the A on the next line. The, the, the Q is the U, the Q transpose is the V transpose, the lambda is the sigma. So those are the good matrices, and they're the ones that you can't improve, basically. They're so good, you, can, you can't make a positive definite symmetric matrix better than it is. Well, maybe diagonalize it or something, but OK. Now, I, I think I've like one question here that that helps to helps me anyway to keep this figure straight. Uh, how I want to count the parameters in this factorization. Uh, how, uh, so I'm two by two. I'm two by two. So A has four numbers, A, B, C, D. then I guess I feel that four numbers should appear on the right-hand side. Somehow the u and the sigma and the v transpose should use up a total of four numbers. So we have a, a nice count, counting match between the left side that's got four numbers a, b, c, d, and the right side that's got four numbers buried in there somewhere. 
is how can we dig them out. Uh, how many numbers in sigma? That's pretty clear. Two. Sigma 1 and sigma 2, the two eigenvalues. How many numbers in this rotation? So I, if I had a different color chalk, I would put 2 for the number of things accounted for by sigma. How many parameters does a 2 by 2 rotation require? 1, and what's a, what's a good word for that 1? or the, 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 that one parameter, it's like I have a cos theta, sine theta, minus sine theta, cos theta. There's a number theta. It's, it's the angle it rotates. So that's one guy to tell the rotation angle, two guys to tell the stretchings, and one more to tell the rotation from you adding up to four. So, so those account, those match up with the four numbers A, B, C, D that we start with. Of course, it's a complicated relation between those four numbers and, and rotations and stretches, but, but it's four equals four anyway. And I guess if you did three by threes, oh, three by threes, what would happen then? So let me take three. Do you want to care for three by threes? Just it's sort of satisfying to get four equal four. But now, what do we get three by three? We got how, how many numbers here? Nine. Oh, so where are those nine numbers? Oh, how many here? That's usually the easy. Three. So, what's your guess for the how many in a rotation? In, in a 3D rotation, you take a sphere and you rotate it. How many? How many numbers to tell you what's what? To tell you what you did? Three. We hope three. Yeah, it's going to be three, three, and three for the for the for the three-dimensional world that we live in. So, people who do rotations for a living. Uh, understand that a rotation in 3D, but how do you see this? Roll pitch and yaw. Sorry? Roll pitch and yaw. Roll pitch and yaw. That sounds good. I mean, it's three words, and we've got it, right? Okay, yeah, roll pitch and yaw. Yeah, I guess a pilot, hopefully, knows about those three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is roll when you sort of like forward and back? <laughs> Does anybody, anybody? Roll, pitch, and yaw? No, nah, you guys must so know. Pitch is, the pitch, is, pitch is the up and down one. Pitch is the up and down one, one. okay. Roll, roll is like, it like a barrel roll. Yes, sorry. And yaw is your side side. Oh, yaw, you're in a, you stay in a plane and you, okay, beautiful. Right, right. And that leads us to R4, four dimensions. Uh, what's your guess on 4D? Well, let's, we could do the count again. If it was 4 by 4, we'd have 16 numbers there. And in the middle, we always have an easy time with that. That would be 4. So we got 12 left to share out. So 6, somehow, 6, six angles in 4 dimensions. Uh, well, we'll leave it there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK. OK. So there's the SVD, but without an example. Uh, examples, you know, I, I would have to compute A transpose A and find it. So the text will do that, it does it for a particular matrix. Oh, the, yeah, the text does it for a, for a matrix 3, 4, 0, 5 that came out pretty well. Uh, a few facts we could learn, though. So the, if I multiply all the eigenvalues together, then I, for a matrix A, what do I get? I get the determinant. What if I multiply the singular values together? Well, again, I get the determinant. You can see it right away from the big formula. Take determinant. 
take determinants. Well, assuming the matrix A is square, so it's got a determinant. Then I take determinants, the determinant of this product. I can take the separate determinants. That has determinant equal to 1, an orthogonal matrix. The, the, uh, the uh, determinant is 1. And similarly here, so, so the product of the sigmas is also the determinant. Yeah, yeah. So the product of the sigmas is also the determinant. The product of the sigmas here will be 15, but you'll find that uh, sigma 1 is smaller than lambda 1. So here are the eigenvalues, lambda 1 less or equal to lambda 2, say, but but the singular values are outside them, yeah. But they still multiply sigma 1 sig times sigma 2 will still be 15, and that's the same as lambda 1 times lambda 2, yeah. But overall, computing the examples of the, of the SVD take more time because, um, well, yeah, you just compute A transpose A, and you've got the Vs, and, the, and you're on your way. And you have to take the square roots of the eigenvalues. So that's the SVD as a piece of pure math. But uh, of course, what we'll do next time, starting right away, is uh, use the SVD. And let me tell you even today, the most, yeah, most important uh, pieces of the SVD. So what do I mean by pieces of the SVD? I've got one more blackboard still to write on. So here we go. So let me write out A is U, the U's times the sigmas, sigmas 1 to R times the V's. V transpose, V1 transpose down to VR transpose. So those are across. Yeah, actually, what I've written here, so there t you could say there's a large, a big economy, there's a, there's a smaller size SVD that has the real stuff that really counts. And then there's a larger SVD that has a whole lot of zeros. So, so this would be the smaller one, m by r. r. This would be r by r. And these would all be positive. And this would be r by n. So that's, the, that's only using the r non-zeros. All these guys are greater than zero. Then the other one, we could fill out to get a square orthogonal matrix, the sigmas, and square Vs, V1 transpose to Vn transpose. So what are the shapes now? This shape is m by m. It's a proper orthogonal matrix. This one also, n by n. So this guy has to be, this is the sigma now, so it has to be what size? m by n, that's the remaining space. So it starts with the sigmas, and then it's all zeros, accounting for null space stuff. Yeah, so you, you should really see that these two are possible. That, that all these zeros, when you multiply out, can, just give nothing. So that really the only thing that non-zero is in these bits. But there's a complete one. So what are these extra u's there in the null space of a, trans, of a, a transpose or a transpose a? Yeah, so two sizes, the, the large size and the small size. But there, then the things that count are all in there. OK. So I was going to do one more thing, and I'm, uh, let me see what, what it was. 
there, so this is section 1.8 of the notes, and you'll see examples there. And you'll see a, a, a second approach to the finding the U's and B's and sigmas. I can tell you what that is, but maybe with uh, uh, just to just to do something nice at the end, let me tell you about another factorization of A that was famous. That's famous in engineering, and it's famous in in uh, geometry. So this is NEA is a U sigma V transpose. We've got that. Now the, the, the other one that I'm thinking of, I'll tell you its name. It's called the polar decomposition of a matrix. And all, all I want you to see is that it's, it's virtually here. So a polar means, what, what's polar in, for a complex number, what, what, what's the polar form of a complex number? E to the I theta? It's E to the I theta times R, yeah. Uh, a real guy, so the real guy R will translate into a symmetric guy, and the E to the I theta will translate into, so what does E, th what kind of a matrix reminds you of E to the I theta? Orthogonal. Orthogonal, size one, so orthogonal. So that's a very, very kind of nice. Every matrix factors into a symmetric matrix times an orthogonal matrix. And I have, of course, described these as the most important classes of matrices. And here we're saying every matrix is a S times a Q. And I'm also saying that I can get that quickly out of, out of the SVD. So I just want to do it. So I want to find an S and find a Q out of this. So to get an S, so let me just start it. U, sigma, but now I'm looking for an S. So what shall I take, put in now? I put, better put in, if I've got U, sigma, something, and I want it to be symmetric, I should put in U transpose would do it. But then if I put in U transpose, I've got to put in U. So now I've got U sigma, U transpose U is the identity. Now I've got to get V transpose. And have I got what the polar decomposition is asking for in this line? So yeah, I think, what have I got here? Where's the, where's the S? in this. So oh, you see, I took the SVD and I just put the identity in there. Just shifted things a little. And now where is the S that I can read off? First three. That's an S. That's a symmetric matrix. And where's the Q? Well, I guess we can see where the Q has to be. Uh, it's here. Yeah. Yeah, so just by sticking U transpose U and looking and putting the parentheses right, I, re I recover uh, that decomposition of a, of a matrix, which in, in mechanical engineering languages, language tells me that any strain can be, you know, which is like stretching of an of a elastic thing, has a, has a, 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 a a uh, symmetric kind of a stretch and an internal twist. Yeah. So that's good. Well, this was a lot of th three, six, nine boards filled with matrices. Well, it is 1806.5, so maybe that's all right, but uh, um, the idea is to use them on a matrix of data. And 
I'll just tell you the key fact. The key fact, if I have a big matrix of data, A, and if I want to pull out of that matrix the important part. So that's what data science has to be doing. Out of a big matrix, some of those, some part of it is noise, some part of it is signal. I'm looking for the most important part of the signal here. So I'm looking for the most important part of the matrix. In a way, the biggest numbers, but, but that doesn't, of course, I'm, I don't look at individual numbers. So what's the biggest part of the matrix? What's the, what are the principal components? Now we're, we're really getting in. If this is a, if this, you know, it could be, data and we want to do statistics, so we want to see what's, what has high variance, what has low variance. We'll, we'll do these connections with statistics. But what's the important part of the matrix? Well, let me look at the U sigma V transpose. Here, yeah, let me look at it. So what's the one most important part of that, of that matrix? One, the rank one, it's a rank one piece. So when I say a part, I'm, of course, it's going to be a matrix part. But so the simple matrix building block is like a rank one matrix, a something, something transpose. And what should I pull out of that as being the most important rank one matrix that's in that product? So I'll erase the 1.8 while you think, what do I do? to pick out the, the big deal, the, the, the thing that the data is telling me first. Well, these are orthonormal. I can, no one is bigger than another one. These are orthonormal. No one is bigger than another one. But here I look here, which is the most important number? Sigma 1. Sigma 1. So the part I pick out is this biggest number times its row times its column. So it's U1 sigma 1 V1 transpose is the, the top principal part of the matrix A. It's the leading part of the matrix A. It's the rank one, the biggest rank one part of the matrix is there. So computing those three guys is the first step to understanding the data. Yeah, so that's what's coming next is, and I guess tomorrow since uh, they moved, Monday, MIT declared uh, t Tuesday to be Monday. Um, they, they didn't change Wednesday, so I'll see you tomorrow for uh, the, the principal components. Good. The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. So this is a pretty key lecture. This lecture is about principal component analysis, PCA, which is a major tool in, in uh, understanding a matrix of data. So what, what is PCA about? Well, first of all, let me remember what was the whole point of last, yesterday's lecture, the singular value decomposition that any matrix A could be broken into R rank one pieces, R being the rank of the matrix, and each piece has a U times a V transpose, and the Good special thing is the U's are orth orthonormal and also the V's are orthonormal. Okay, so that's the whole matrix. But we have a big matrix and we want to get the important information out of it, not all the information. It, it, people say if, if, if in, in uh, machine learning, if you've learned all the training data, you haven't learned anything really. You've just like copied it all in. You, the whole point of, of neural nets and uh, um, 
the process of machine learning is to learn important facts about the data. And now here we're at the most basic stage of that. And I claim that the important facts about the matrix are in its largest k singular values, the largest k pieces. We can take k equal 1 would tell us the largest single piece, but maybe we have space and computing power to handle 100 pieces. So I would take k equal 100. The matrix might have ranked thousands. So I claim that a k is the best. Now here's the one theorem for today that a k using the first, the first k pieces of the SVD is the best approximation to a of rank k. So I'll write that down. So that's, that really says why the SVD is perfect. OK, so that's, that statement says that if, if b, another matrix, has rank k, then the distance from A to B, the error you're making in just using B, that error is greater than or equal to the error you make for the best guy. So that's a pretty straightforward, beautiful fact. And uh, it goes back to people who discovered the SVD in the first place. But then uh, a couple of psychologists gave a proof in a later paper, and it's often called the Eckert-Young theorem. There's the theorem. Isn't that straightforward? And the hypothesis is straightforward. That's pretty nice. But of course, uh, we have to think, why is it true? Why is it true? And to give meaning to the theorem, we have to say what these double bars are. Do you know the right name for this? So that double bar around a matrix is called the, the norm of the matrix, the norm. So I have to say something about matrix norms. How big is? That's a measure of how big it is. And uh, what I have to say is, there are many different measures of a matrix, how large that matrix is. Let me tell you for today three possible measures of a matrix. So different ways to measure a matrix. I'll call the matrix just A, maybe. But then I'm going to apply the measure to A minus B and to A minus AK and, and show that that is the smaller. OK, so I'm, I want to tell you about the norm of A, about some possible norms of A. And actually, the norms I'm going to take today will be, will have the special feature that they can be found, computed by the singular values. So let me mention the, the L2 norm. That is the largest singular value. So that's an important measure of the sort of the size of a matrix. I'm talking here, yeah, about a general m by n matrix A. Sigma 1 is, the, is, is an important norm, often called the L2 norm, and that's where that index 2 goes. Oh, I should really start with vectors, norms of vectors, and then build to norms of matrices. Let me do norms of vectors over on this side. The L2 norm of a vector. Do we know what that is? That's the regular length of the vector that we all expect. The square root of v1 squared up to vn squared. The, the hypotenuse, the length of the hypotenuse in n-dimensional space. That's the L2 norm because of that 2. The L1 norm of a vector is just add up those pieces without squaring and, and square rooting them, just add them. That's the L1 norm. 
And you might say, why do we want two norms? Or there are more norms. Let me just tell you one more. The infinity norm, and there's a reason for the one and the two and the infinity, is the largest of the Vs. OK. Have you met norms before? I don't know. These are vector norms that maybe you have met. Then we're going to have matrix norms that maybe will be new. Um, so this is the norm that we usually think of. But uh, this one has become really, really important. And let me tell you just why. And then we'll, the later section of the notes and a later lecture in this course, we'll develop that develop this. This is the L1 norm. So this is L2, L1, and L infinity, as often as you see. So what's special about this one? Well, it just turned out, and it was only discovered you know, in our lifetimes, that when you minimize some function using the L1 norm, you minimize some, uh, say, signal to noise or whatever you minimize, some function. If you use L1, the winning vector, the minimizing vector, turns out to be sparse. And what does sparse mean? Sparse means mostly zero components. Somehow, when I minimize in L2, which, which is historically goes back to Gauss, the greatest mathematician of all time, when you minimize something in L2, you do least squares. And you find that the guy that gives you the minimum has a lot of little numbers, a lot of little components. Because when you square those little ones, they, they don't hurt much. But Gauss, so Gauss didn't do least L1 norm. That has different names, basis per suit. And, and it comes into uh, uh, signal processing and uh, sensing. Right. And it, then it was discovered that if you minimize, uh, as we'll see in that norm, you amazingly get uh, 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 the winning vector has mo is mostly zeros. And the advantage of that is that you can understand what its components are. The one with many small components, you like, you have no interpretation for that answer. But for an answer that just has a few non-zero components, you really see what's happening. And then this is an important one, too. OK. OK, now I'm going to turn just to, so what's the property of a norm? Well, you can see that the norm of c times a vector is just multiplying by 6 or 11 or minus pi or whatever is the size of c. Norms have that nice property. They're, they're uh, homogeneous or whatever word. If you multi double the vector, you should double the norm. That double the length, that makes sense. And then the, the important property is that is the famous triangle inequality that if you if V and W are two sides of a triangle and you take the norm of V and add to the norm of W, the two sides, you get more than the straight norm along the hypotenuse. Yeah, so those are properties that we require and, and, uh, and, the, and the fact that the norm is positive, which is, uh, I won't write down, but it's important too. OK, so those are norms. And those will apply also to matrix norms. So if I double a matrix, I want to double its norm. And of course, that works for the two norm. And actually, probably, so the triangle inequality for this norm is saying that the largest singular value of A plus B, two matrices, is less or equal to the largest singular value of A plus the largest singular value of B. And that's, we, we won't take class time to check uh, 
uh, minor, it, 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 straightforward things like that. So now I'm going to continue with the three norms that I want to tell you about. That's a very important one. Then there's another norm that's named at, is, has an F, and it's named after Frobenius. Sorry about that. And what is that norm? That norm looks at all the entries in the matrix, just like a, it was a long vector, and squares them all and adds them up. So in a way, it's like the two norm for a vector. It's so the squared, or shall I put square root? Maybe I should. Is the square root of all the little people in in the matrix? So a one n squared plus the next a two one squared and so on. You finally get to a m n squared. You you all the you just treat the matrix like a long vector. And uh, Take the square root, just just like so. That's that's the Frobenius norm, and then finally, not not so well known, is something that's more like L1. It's uh, called the nuclear norm, and not all the faculty would know about this nuclear norm. So it is the sum of the sigma of the singular values. I guess there are of them, so that's where we would stop. Oh, OK. So those are three norms. Now, why, why do I pick on those three norms? And, and the, here's the point, that those, for those three norms, this statement is true. I could cook up other matrix norms for which this wouldn't work. But for these three highly important norms, this Eckert-Young statement that the closest rank k approximation is found from the first k pieces, you see, that's a good thing. Because that, that, this is what we compute from the SVD. So now we've solved an approximation problem. We found the, minimum, the best b uh, is a k. And the point is, it could use all the any of those norms. So there would be a well. Somebody finally came up with a proof that would that does all three norms at once. Uh, in the notes, I do uh, that one separately from Frobenius. And actually, I found uh, in an MIT thesis. Just I was just reading a, a course six. PhD thesis, and the author who's speaking tomorrow in, uh, and, or Friday at, in, in uh, IDSS, um, uh, Dr. Srebro, uh, found a nice new proof of Frobenius, and it's in the notes, as well as the, an older proof. OK. You know, as I talk here, I'm not too sure whether it is essential for me to go through the proof either in the L2 norm, which takes half a page in the notes, or in the Frobenius norm, which takes more. I'd rather you see the point. The point is that in these norms, and now what is special about these norms of a matrix? These depend only on the sigmas. Only on the oh, uh, uh, well, I'll finish that sentence because it was true. These these norms depend only on the singular values, right? That one at least depends only on the singular value. It's the largest one. This one is the sum of them all. This one comes into the Netflix competition, by the way. This was the right norm to win zillion dollars in the Netflix competition. So what did Netflix put? It did a math competition. Uh, it had um, uh, movie preferences from many, many Netflix subscribers. They gave their ranking to uh, a bunch of movies. 
But of course, they hadn't seen, no, none of them had seen all the movies. So the matrix of rankings, where you had the ranker and the matrix, uh, is a very big matrix, but it's got missing entries. If the ranker didn't see the movie, he, he, isn't, he or she isn't ranking it. So what's the idea about Netflix? So they offered a, like a million dollar prize. And a lot of math and computer science people fought for that prize. And uh, over the years, they got like higher 92, 93, 94% right. So, but it turned out that this was, well, you had to, in the end, you had to use a little psychology of how people voted. So it was partly about human psychology, but it was also a very large matrix problem with an incomplete matrix an incomplete matrix, and so it had to be completed. You had to figure out what would the ranker have said about the post if he hadn't seen it, but had ranked uh, you know, several other movies, uh, like All the President's Men or whatever, uh, given a ranking to those. You have to, and that's a recommender system, of course. That's, what, that's how you get recommendations from from Amazon. They've got a, a big matrix calculation here, and if you've bought uh, a couple of math books, they're going to tell you about more math books, more than you want to know. <laughs> right? Yeah. Okay. So anyway, it just turned out that this norm was the right one to minimize. I, I, I can't give you all the details of the Netflix competition. But this turned out to be the right norm to do a minimum problem, a best, not least squares. These squares would look at some other norm, but a best nuclear norm uh, completion of the matrix. And, uh, that, and, and now it's, uh, so now it's being put to much more serious uses for, for MRI. Magnetic resonance stuff, you know, when you go in and get, you, it's a noisy system, but uh, you get, uh, it, it gives an excellent uh, um, picture of, of uh, what's going on. So, so it, I'll just write Netflix here, so it gets in the, and then MRIs. So what's the point about MRIs? Um, so if you don't, if you stay in long enough, you get a, you get a, you get all the numbers. There aren't any, there isn't missing data. But if you, as with a child, you might want to just have the child in for a few minutes, then that's not enough to get a complete picture, and you have again uh, missing data in your matrix of, of. Uh, uh, in your in your in the image from the MRI, so then of course you've got to complete that matrix. You have to fill in what, what would the what would the, the MRI have seen in those positions where it didn't look long enough. And again, uh, the nuclear norm is the good one for that. Okay. So there's uh, there there will be a whole section on norms. Uh, maybe just about in, uh, in Stellar by now. Okay. So I'm not going to, uh, let me just say, like, what does this, what does this say? What does this tell us? Uh, so I'll just give an example. Maybe I'll take, start, start with the example that's in the notes. Suppose K is 2. So I'm looking of, among all rank two matrices, and suppose my matrix is four, three, two, one, and all the rest zeros. Diagonal. And it's a for rank four matrix. I can see its singular values. They're sitting there. Those would be the singular values and the eigenvalues and everything, of course. Uh, now, what would be A2? What would be the best approximation of rank 2 to that matrix? 
in, if, if in this sense to be completed. What would A2 do? Yeah, it would be 4 and 3. It would pick the two largest. So I'm looking at AK. A, this is K equal to 2. So it has to have rank 2. This has got rank 4. The biggest pieces are those. OK. So this thing says that if I had any other matrix B, it would be further away from A than this guy. It says that this is the closest. And I just, uh, like, could, could you think of a matrix that could possibly be closer and be rank 2? That, rank 2 is the tricky thing. The, the matrices of rank 2 form a kind of crazy set. If I add a rank 2 matrix to a rank 2 matrix, probably the rank is up to 4. So, so the rank 2 matrices are all kind of floating around in, in, little, in their own little corners. Uh, this looks like the best one. But in the notes, I suggest, well, you could get a rank 2 mate, a rank, I could, well, what about B? What about this B? I, for this guy, I could get uh, closer, maybe not exact, but closer, maybe by taking 3.5, 3.5. Oh, but I only want to use rank, I've only got two rank two to play with. So I better make this into a rank, I have to like make this into a rank one piece and then the two and the one. So you see what I, what I thought of? I thought, man, maybe that's better. Like on the diagonal, I'm coming closer. Uh, well, I'm not getting it exactly here, but then I've got one left to play with and I'll put maybe, 1.5 down here. OK, so that's a rank 2 matrix, two little rank 1s. And on the diagonal, it's better. 3.5s, I'm only missing by a half. 1.5s, I'm missing by a half. So I'm only missing by a half on the diagonal, where this guy was missing by 2. So maybe I've found something better. But I had to pay a price of these things off the diagonal to keep the rank low, and uh, they kill me. So that B will be further away from A, the error. If I computed A minus B and computed its norm, I would see bigger than, bigger than the A minus A2. Yeah, yeah. So you see the point of the theorem? That, that's really what I'm I'm trying to say that it's not obvious. You may, you may feel, well, it's totally obvious. Pick four and three. What, what else could do it? But it depends on the norm and so on. So it's not, not Eckert Young had to think of a proof and other people too. OK, so that's now, but you could say, also say, object that I started with a diagonal matrix here. That's so special. But what I want to say is the diagonal matrix is not that special because uh, I could take A. So let me now just call this diagonal matrix D. Oh, let me call it sigma to give it another sort of appropriate name. So I, if I thought of matrices, what, what I want to say is this could be the sigma matrix. And there could be a, a U on the left of it and a sigma on the right of it. So, so about A is U sigma V transpose. So this is my sigma. And this is like any orthogonal matrix U. And this is like any V transpose. Right? I'm just saying, here's a whole lot more matrices. There's just one matrix. But now I have all these matrices with U's multiplying on the left and V transpose on, on the right. And I ask you this question. What are the singular values of that matrix? A. Here the singular values were clear, 4, 3, 2, and 1. What are the singular values of this matrix A when I've multiplied by an 
orthogonal guy on both sides? That's a key question. What are the singular values of, of that one? Four, three, two, one. Didn't change. Why is that? Because the singular values are the, because this has an SVD form, orthogonal times diagonal times orthogonal, and that diagonal contains the singular values. What I'm saying is that my, and our trivial little example here, actually was all, all four by fours that have these singular values. I could, my whole problem is orthogonally invariant, a math guy would say. When I multiply by a U or a V transpose or both, the problem doesn't change. Norms don't change. Yeah, that's the point. Yeah, I, I realize it now. This is the point. If I multiply the matrix A by, a, by an orthogonal matrix U, it has all the same norms. It doesn't change the norm. Actually, that was true way back for vectors. With, with this length, with this length, wh what's the deal about vectors? Suppose I, suppose I have a vector V and I've computed its hypotenuse and the norm, and now I look at Q times V in that same two norm. What's, what's special about that? So I took any vector V and I know what its length is, hypotenuse. Now I multiply by Q. What happens to the length? Doesn't change. Doesn't change. Uh, uh, orthogonal matrix, you could think of it as just like rotating the triangle in space. The hypotenuse doesn't change. And we've checked that because we could, you know, the check is to square it and then you're doing QV transpose QV and you simplify it the usual way, and then you have Q transpose Q equal the identity, and you're golden. Yeah, so the result is you get the same answer as V. So, uh, let me put it in a sentence, and then I'll pause. Uh, multiplying the, that norm is not changed by orthogonal matrix. And these norms are not changed by orthogonal matrices. Because if I multiply the A here by an orthogonal matrix, I, I have, this is my A. If I multiply by, by a Q, then I have Q U sigma V transpose. And what is the, really the underlying point? that QU is an orthogonal matrix just as good as U. So if I, so let me put this down. QA would be QU sigma V transpose. And now I'm asking you, what's the singular value decomposition for QA? And I hope I'm actually seeing it. What's the singular value decomposition of QA? What are the singular values? What's the diagonal matrix? Just look there for it. The diagonal matrix is sigma. What goes on the right of it? The V transpose. And what goes on the left of it is QU. Because that's orthogonal times orthogonal. Everybody in this room has to know that if I multiply two orthogonal matrices, the result is, again, orthogonal. So I can multiply by Q, and it only affects the the U part, not the sigma part. And so it doesn't change any of those norms. OK. So that's fine. That's what I wanted to say about the Eckert-Young theorem, not proving it, but, but hopefully giving you an example there of what it means that, that this is the best rank to, to approximate that one. OK, so that's the key math behind PCA. So now I have to want to, not, ju not just have to, but want to tell you about PCA. So what's, what's that about? So we have a bunch of data. 
and we want to see. So let me take a bunch of data, a bunch of data points. Say points in the plane. So I have a bunch of data points in the plane. Uh, I'll put, so here's my data vector. First, uh, vector x1. Well, x, is that a good, maybe v1? Th these are just two component guys, v2. They're, they're just columns with two components. So I'm, I'm just measuring, like, height and age. And I want to find the relationship between height and age. So the first row is, meant, is the heights of my uh, data, and the second row is the ages. So these are, so, so I've, I've got, say, a lot of people. And these are the heights, and these are the ages. And I've got n points in 2D. And I want to make sense out of that. I want to I want to look for the relationship between height and age. I'm actually going to look for a linear relation between height and age. Okay. So uh, first of all, these are all over the place. So the first step that a statistician does is to get mean zero, get the average to be zero. So what is so so th all these points are all over the place. From row one, the heights, I subtract the average height. So this is A, the matrix I'm really going to work on, is, is my matrix A minus the average height. Well, in, in all components. So this is A, 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 A. I'm subtracting. I'm subtracting the mean, so average height and average age. Oh, that was a brilliant notation. A sub A. Can't be A sub A. You see what the matrix has done. This, this matrix of two means has just, just made each row of A now adds to row now adds to what? If I have a bunch of things and I've subtracted off their mean, so the mean or the average is now zero, then those things add up to zero. Right. I've just like brought these points into something like here. This is this is uh, age. And this is height, and uh, let's see. And by subtracting, uh, it no longer is unreasonable to have negative age and negative height, because I've so right. The, the little kids, when I subtracted off the, the average age, they ended up with a negative age. The old. Older ones ended up still positive. And somehow, I've got a whole lot of points, but hopefully, their, their mean is now 0. Do you see that I've, I've centered the, the data at 0, 0? And I'm looking for, what, what am I looking for here? I'm looking for the best line. That's what I want to find. And that would be a problem in PCA. What's the best linear relation? Because PCA is limited. PCA isn't all of deep learning by any means. The whole success of deep learning was the final realization after a bunch of years that they had to have a nonlinear function in there to, to get, to, get to, to model serious data. But here's PCA is a linear business. And I'm looking for the best line. And you will say, wait a minute. I know how to find the best line. Just use the squares. Gauss did it. Can't be all bad. 
but PCA, and, and I was giving a talk in New York when I was just learning about this. Uh, and somebody said, what you're doing with PCA has to be the same as least squares. It's finding the best line. And I knew it wasn't, but I didn't know how to answer the question best. And now at least I know better. So the best line in least squares, can I remind you about least squares? Because this is not least squares. The best line of least squares, so I have some data points, and I have a best line that goes through them, and, and least squares I don't always center the data to mean zero, but I could. But what, what, what do you minimize in least squares, or li least squares? If you remember the picture in linear algebra books of least squares, you, you measure the errors, like the three errors, and it's how much you're wrong at those three points. Those are the three errors, the a, a difference between AX and B, the, the B minus AX that you square and you add up those three errors. And what's different over here? I mean, there's more points, but that's not the, that's not the point. That's not the difference. The difference is in PCA, you're measuring perpendicular to the line. You're adding up all these little guys, squaring them. So you're adding up their squares and minimizing. So the points, you see it's a different problem, and therefore it has a different answer. That, that, uh, and this answer turns out to involve the uh, SVD, the sigmas, where this answer, you remember from ordinary linear algebra, just when you minimize that, you got to an equation that leads, <coughs> leads to what equation for the best x? So do you remember? Yeah, what, what is it now? Everybody should know. A, yeah, we, I mean, and we will actually see it in this course because we're doing the heart of linear algebra here. We haven't done it yet, though. And tell me again, what, ma what matrix, what equation do I solve for, the, for that problem? A transpose A, X hat equal A transpose B, called the normal equations. It's sort of hard of. It's this, it's this a regression in, in statistics language. That's a regression problem. This is a different problem. Okay, just so now you see the answer. So that involves, well, they both involve A transpose A. That's sort of interesting because you have a rectangular matrix A and then sooner or later A transpose A is coming. But... Uh, this involves solving a linear system of equations, so it's fast, and we will do it. And uh, it's very important, probably the most important application in 1806. But it's not the same as this one. So this is now in 1806, maybe the last day uh, is PCA. So I didn't put those letters, principal, component analysis, PCA, which statisticians have been doing for a long time. It's, we're not doing something brand new here. But the result is that we, so, so how does a statistician think about this problem or that data matrix? What if you have a matrix of data, two by two rows and many columns, so many, many samples, what, uh, and we've made the mean zero, so that's the first step a statistician takes to check on the mean. What's the next step? 
what else does a statistician do with data to measure how its size? There's another number. There's a number that goes with the mean, and it's the variance. The mean and the variance. So somehow we're going to do variances. And it's, it will really be involved because we have two sets of data, heights and ages, we're really going to have the covariance. Covariance matrix. And it will be two by two. Because it will tell us not only the variance in the heights, that's what a first thing a statistician would think about, you know, some small people, some big people, and variation in ages, but also the link between them. How are the height-age pairs? Does, does more height, does more age go with more height? And of course it does. That's the whole point there. So it's this covariance matrix, and that covariance matrix, or the sample covariance matrix, to give it its full name. What, what's the, so just touching on statistics for a moment here. What's the, when we see that word sample in the, in the name, what is that telling us? That's telling us that this matrix is computed from the samples, not from a theoretical probability distribution. We might have a proposed distribution that the height follows the age, the age follow, height follows the age by some formula, and that would give us a theoretical variances. We're doing sample variances, also called empirical covariance. Empirical says, empirical, that word means from the information, from the data. So that's what we do, and it is exactly a, a it's AA transpose. Ah, we, you have to normalize it by the number of data points, n. And then for some reason, best known to statisticians, it's n minus 1. And of course, they've got to be right. They've been around a long time. and they, they, It should be n minus 1 because Somehow, one degree of freedom was accounted for when we took, took away the, when we made the mean zero. So, so we, anyway, no, no problem. But, but the n minus one is not going to affect our com computation here. That, this is the matrix that tells us that, that's what we work, that's what we've got to work with. That's what we've got to work with, the matrix AA transpose. And then the, so we have this problem. So we have a, yeah, I, I, I guess we really have a minimum problem. We want to find, well, yeah, what, what problem are we solving? And it's, yeah. So our, our, our problem was not least squares, not, not the same as least squares, similar but not the same. We want to minimize, so we're looking for that best line where age equals some number C times the height times the, yeah, or, or height. Maybe it would have been better to put age here and height here. No, no. We took a, a two unknowns. So I'm looking for C. I'm looking for the number C. I'm looking for the number C. And with just two minutes in class left, what is that number C going to be when I finally get the problem stated properly and then solve it? I'm going to learn that the best ratio of age to height is sigma 1. Sigma 1. That's the, that's the one that tells us how those two are connected. And the Orthogonal, and what will be the best, uh, yeah, what, uh, no, maybe I, maybe I didn't answer that the right, I did, maybe I didn't get that right. Because I'm looking for, 
I'm looking for the vector that points in the right way. Yeah, I'm sorry. I think the answer is it's got to be there in the SVD. I think it's the vector u1. It's the principal component, u, u1. Let, let's do that properly uh, on Friday. Uh, I, I hope you see, because this was like a first step away from the highlights of linear algebra to problems solved by linear algebra and practical problems. And uh, my, my point is that the SVD solves these. OK. The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Okay, let me start one minute early. So this being MIT, I just came from a faculty, a terrific uh, faculty member, Andy Lowe, in, in, uh, in uh, the Sloan School. And I have to tell you what he told us. And then I had, I had to leave before he could explain why it's true. But this is like an amazing fact, which I don't want to forget. So here you go. This is, everything will be on that board. So it's, it's, it's an observation about us or other people. Maybe not us, but <laughs> so suppose you have a biased coin. Maybe you don't, the people playing this game don't know, but it's 75% likely to produce heads, 25% likely to produce tails. And then the player has to guess for one flip after another, heads or tails. And uh, you get a dollar if you're right, you pay a dollar if you're wrong. So you just want to get as many right choices as possible from this coin flip that continues. So what should you do? Well, what I guess I hope we would do is we would not know what the probabilities were. So we would guess maybe heads the first time, tails the second time, heads the third time, and so on. But the actual result would be mostly heads. So we would learn at some point, that maybe, maybe not quite as soon as that, we would eventually learn that we should keep guessing heads, right? And then we would be, that would be our optimal strategy to guess heads all the time. But what do people actually do? They do start like this, same way, and then they, they're beginning to learn that heads is more common. So maybe they do more heads and tails, but sometimes tails is right. And then after a little while, they maybe see that it's, yeah. Or, or they're just, well, maybe they're not counting. They're just like operating like ordinary people. And what do ordinary people actually do in the long run? You would think, guess heads every time, right? But they don't. In the long run, people and maybe animals and whatever guess heads three quarters of the time and tails one quarter of the time. Isn't that unbelievable? They're guessing tails a quarter of the time when the odds are never changing. Anyway, that's, that's something that economists and, and uh, other people have to explain. And, if I had been able to stay another hour, I could tell you about the explanation. But anyway, that's, that's uh, I, oh, I see I've written that on a board that I have no way to bury. So it's going to be there, and it's not the subject of 18065. But it's uh, kind of amazing. Right. So there's good math problems everywhere. OK, can I just leave you with what I know? and? 
And if I learn more, I'll come back to that question. OK. Please turn attention this way, right? <laughs> norms. A little, a few words on norms. Just like that should be a word in your language. And, and so you should know what it means, and you should know there a few of the important norms. Again, a norm is a way to measure the size of a vector, or the size of a matrix, or the size of a tensor, whatever we have, or a function, very important. A norm would be a, a, a function like sine x from 0 to pi. What would be the size of that function? Well, if it was 2 sine x, the size would be twice as much. So the norm should reflect that. Uh, but uh, so yesterday, or Wednesday, I told you the, so there p equals 2, 1, actually infinity. And then I'm going to put in z the 0 norm with a question mark, because you'll see it's, it, that it has a problem. But let me just recall from last time. So these are the p equal to 2 is the usual sum of squares, square root, usual length of a vector. p equal 1 is this very important norm. So I would call that the L1 norm. And we'll see a lot of that. That really, I mentioned that it plays a very significant part now in compressed sensing. It really was a bombshell in signal processing to discover and in other fields, too, to discover that some things really work well, work best in the L1 norm. Uh, the maximum norm has a natural part to play. And uh, it, we'll see that, or its matrix analog. So I didn't mention the L0 norm. O all this LP business. So the LP norm for, for any P is you take the piece power to the piece power up here, p was 2, and you take the piece root. So oh, maybe I should write it to the 1 over p. That's th then that way, taking piece powers and piece roots, we do get the norm of 2v has a factor 2 compared to the norm of v. So p equal to 2, you see that we've got it right there. p equal 1, you see it here, because it's just, just the sum of the absolute values. p equal infinity, if I, if I move p up and up and up, it will pick out, uh, you know, as I increase p, whichever one is biggest is going to just take over. And that's why you get the max norm. Now the zero norm where I'm using that word like improperly, as you'll see, because if, so w what is the zero norm? It, it's the, so, so let me, let me write a sort of complete. It's the number of non-zeros, of non-zero components. It's the, it's the thing that you'd like to know about in question of sparsity. Does the, is there just one non-zero component? Are there 11? Are there 101? Like what, that's, you might want to minimize that because sparse vectors and sparse matrices are much faster to compute with. You've got good stuff. But now I claim that's not a norm, the number of zero non-zero components because What's the norm of 2? How does the norm of 2v compare with the norm of v, the zero norm? It would be the same. 2v has the same number of non-zeros as v. So it violates the rule for a norm. So I think with these norms and all the p's in between, so actually the, the, the math papers are full of let p be between 1 and infinity. And because that's the range where you do have a proper norm, as, as we will see. I think the good thing to do with these norms is to have a picture in your mind. 
the geometry of a norm is real is good. So the picture I'm going to suggest is plot all the vectors, let's say, in 2D. So two-dimensional space, R2. So I want to plot the, the, the vectors that have V equal 1 in these different norms. So let me ask you what, so I, here's 2D space, R2. And now I want to plot all the vectors that have the ordinary L2 length equal 1. So what does that picture look like? I, I just think a picture is really worth something. It's a circle. Thanks. It's a circle. It's a circle. This circle is, has the equation, of course, V1 squared plus V2 squared equal 1. So that... I would call that the unit ball for the norm or whatever is is a circle. Okay, now now here comes more interesting. What about in the L1 norm? So again, tell me how to plot all the points that have v1 plus v2 equal 1. What what what's the boundary going to look like now? It's going to be, let's see, well, I can put it on a certain number of points. There out, out at 1, and there at 1, and there at minus 1, and there at minus 1. Those, that would be the vector, that would reflect the vector 1, 0. And this would reflect the vector 0, minus 1. So, yeah. Okay. So those are like four points easy to plot, easy to see the the L1 norm, but what's the full, what's the, what's the rest of the boundary here? It's a diamond. Good. It's a diamond. It's, we have linear set equal to 1. Up here in the positive quadrant, it's just V1 plus V2 equal 1, and the graph of that is a straight line. So all these guys, this is all the points with v1 plus v2 equal 1. And over here, and over here, and over here. So the unit ball in the L1 norm is a diamond. And that, that's a very important picture. It, it reflects in a simple, very simple way something important about the L1 norm and the reason it's just... Uh, exploded in, in importance. Let me continue, though. What about the max norm? V max, or V infinity equal 1. So again, let me plot these guys, and these guys are certainly going to be in it again. The 0, you know, the i, I plus or minus i and plus or minus j, the, our good friends. Uh, what's the rest of the boundary look like now? Now, this, this means uh, max of the v's equal 1. So what, what are the rest of the points? You see, it does take a little thought, but then you get it, and you, and you don't for, forget it. OK, so what's, what's up? Uh, I'm looking. So suppose the maximum is v1. I think you're going to go, I, I think it's going to look like that. Out to, out to 1, 0, and up to 0, 1. And up here, the vector would be 1, 1 0.4 or something. So the maximum would be 1. Is, is that OK? So, so, so somehow. What, what really sees as you change this number p, you start with uh, p equal 1, a diamond, and it kind of swells out to be a circle at p equal to 2. And then it kind of it keeps swelling to be a square at p equal infinity. That, that's an that's a interesting thing. And the, yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, now, What's the problem with the zero norm? This is the number of non-zeros. 
OK, let me draw it. Where are the points with one non-zero? So, so, so I'm plotting the, the unit ball. Where are, the, where, are the, where are the vectors in this thing that have one non-zero, not, not zero non-zero, so the, that's not included. And, but I, but, so what do I have? I'm not allowed the vector one-third, two-thirds, because that has two non-zeros. So where are the points with only one non-zero? Yeah, on the axes. Yeah, that, that tells you. So, so it can be there and, and there. Oops, without that guy. And of course, those just keep going out. So it totally violates the, the, uh, the uh, uh, you know, it, so maybe the point that I should make about these figures. So, so like what's happening when I go down to zero, I'm, I'm sort of, it, really that figure should be at the other end, right? Oh, no, it shouldn't. <laughs> this guy's in the middle. This is a b b badly drawn figure. L2 is kind of the center guy. L1 is the, uh, at one end, L infinity is at the other end, and this one has gone off the end at the left there. The, the, the diamond has, yeah, what's happened here, as, as, as that one goes down towards zero, none of these will be okay. These, these, uh, these balls will, or these sets will uh, lose weight. Uh, so they'll always have these points in, but they'll be uh, like this, and then like this, and then finally in the, in the unacceptable limit. But none of those, th th this was not any good either. This, this was for p equal a half, let's say. Sort of a, that, that's a p equal a half, and that's not a good norm. Yeah, so maybe the thing, you, so there's a property of the circle, the diamond, and the square, which is, is a, a nice mass property of those, of those three sets, and is not possessed by this, as this thing loses weight, I, I lose the property. And then, of course, that's totally lost over there. Do you know what that property would be? What, what, it's what? Concave. You concave, convex, convex, I would say. Convex. This is a true norm, has the convex unit. Ball. Maybe, maybe for ball, I'm taking all of these less or equal one. Yeah, so I'm, I'm allowing the insides of these shapes. So this is not a convex set. That, that set, which I should maybe, so not, not convex would be this one with uh, like so. And that reflects the fact that the, uh, Oh, the, the rules for a norm are broken. The triangle inequality is probably broken. And the, the, the yeah, other, other stuff. Yeah. I, I think that's sort of like worth remembering. And then uh, one more norm that's uh, natural to think about is, uh, so S as in the Piazza question, S does always represent a symmetric matrix in 18065. And now I'm going to ask, my norm is going to be, so I'm going to call it the S norm. So S is a, actually it's a positive definite symmetric matrix. F is a positive definite symmetric matrix. And what will I do? I'll take V transpose AV, SV, sorry. SV. Okay, what's our word for that? The energy. That's the energy in the vector V. And I'll take the square root so that I so that I now have the length of two if I d double V from V to two V, then I get a two here and a two here, and when I take the square root I get a overall two, and that's what I want. 
I want the norm to grow linearly with the two or three or whatever I multiply by. But what is the shape of this thing? So what is the what is the shape of let me, let me put it on this board. I, I'm going to get a picture like that. So what is the shape of V transpose S V equal one or less or equal one uh, if S is this is a positive, symmetric positive definite. People use those three letters to tell us. I, I'm claiming that we get a bunch of norms. Wh when do we get the L2 norm? F what, uh, what matrix S would this give us the L2 norm? The identity, certainly. Now, what's going to happen if I use some different matrix S? This circle is going to change shape. I'm going to have a different norm depending on S. And a typical case would be S equal 2, 3, say. That's a positive definite symmetric matrix. And this, this now I would be drawing the graph of 2V1 squared plus 3V2 squared. That would be the energy, right? Equal 1. And I just want you to tell me what shape that is. So that's a perfectly good norm. It, it, you could check all its properties. They, they all come out easily. But I get a new picture, a new norm that's kind of adjustable. You could say it's a weighted norm. Weights mean that you kind of have picked some numbers sort of appropriate to the particular problem. Well, suppose those numbers are 2 and 3. What shape is the unit ball in this S norm? It's an ellipse, right. It's an ellipse. And I guess it'll actually be, so the larger number three will, will mean you can't go as far as, as the smaller number two. I think it would probably be an ellipse like this. And the axis, axis length of the ellipse would probably have something to do with the two and the three. OK, so that's just, now you know really all the vector norms that are sort of natural to use. Uh, the, the, these are come up in a natural way. They're all, as we said, the identity matrix brings us back to the two norm. So these are all sort of variations on the two norm. And these are variations as P runs from one up to two on to infinity and is not allowed to go below 1. OK, that's norms. And then uh, maybe you can actually see from this picture. Here, here's a like somewhat hokey uh, um, idea of why it is that this norm, minimizing the, so minimizing the error in this norm. So wh what do I mean by that? I, uh, here, here would be a typical problem. Minimize subject to AX equal B the L1, uh, sorry, I'm using X now, the L1 norm of, the L1 norm of X. <clears throat> how, how, so that would be an important problem. Actually, it has a name. People have spent a lot of time thinking of a fast way to solve it. It's almost like least squares. What would, what would make it more like least squares would be change that to two. Yeah, yeah. Can I just sort of like sketch without making a big argument here the difference between L equal one or two here? Yeah, just, I'll just draw a picture. Now, I'll erase this ellipse, but you won't forget it. OK. So this, this is our problem. The L, with L1, it has a famous name, basis pursuit. Well, famous to people who work in optimization. For L2, it has an important name. Well, it's sort of like these squares, uh, ridge regression, all sorts of 
of the, these, this is like a beautiful model problem. Among all solutions to AX, suppose this is just one equation, like, like uh, C1X1 plus C2X2 equals some right side B. So the X's, the constraint says that the vectors X have to be on a line. There's, suppose that's a graph of that line. So as, of, um, among all these X's, which one, yeah, oh, I never, I'm realizing what, this, what I'm going to say is going to be smart, okay? I mean, not, it's going to be nice. Uh, it's not going to be difficult. Let's do the one we know best, L2. So here's a picture of the line. Let me, let me make it a little more tilted so, so you, yeah, 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 like, like two, three. Okay. Where, this is the xy plane. Here's x1, here's x2, here are, the, here are the points that satisfy my condition. Which one minimizes, which point on that line minimizes as the smallest L2 norm? Which point on the line has the smallest L2 norm? Yeah, you're, you're drawing the right figure with your hand. The smallest L2 norm, L2, remember, is just how far out you go. It's, it's circular here, so it doesn't matter what direction. They're all giving the same L2 norm. It's just how far. So we're looking for the closest point on the line because we don't want to go any further. We want to go a minimum distance with L. I'm doing L2 now. So if... Uh, so where's the point at minimum distance? Yeah, it should show me again once more with hands or whatever. I, I, it'll be that. I didn't want 45 degree angles there. I'm going to erase it again and really, this time I'm going to get angles that are not 45 because that obviously. All right, brilliant. Got it. Okay, that's my line. Okay, and what's the nearest point in the L2 norm? Here's the winner in L2, right? The nearest point. Everybody sees that picture? So that's the, that's, you know, that's a basic uh, picture for, for minimizing something with a constraint, which is the fundamental problem of optimization of neural nets, of everything, really, Minim of life. Uh, well, I'm getting philosophical, so we get, okay, that's, that's, but of course it always, the question always is, and maybe it's true in life too, which norm are you using? Okay, now, count, so count, that was the minimum in L2, that's the shortest distance, where distance means what we usually think of it as meaning, but now let's go for the L1 norm. Which point on the line has the smallest L1 norm? So now I'm going to add the two. So if this is some point A, this is some point A0, and this is some point 0B, right there. So those two points are obviously important. And that point we could figure out the formula for, because it's we, we know what the geometry is, but I've just put those two points in. So did I get a zero B? Yeah, that's a zero. Oh, I, so let me just ask you the question. What point on that line has the smallest L1 norm? Which has the smallest L1 norm? If somebody said it, just say it a little louder so that you're on tape forever. Uh, <laughs> Zero B, this point, that's the winner. This is the L1 winner. And this was the L2 winner. And notice what I said earlier, and I didn't see it coming, but now I realize this is a figure to put in the notes. Uh, the winner has the most zeros. It's the sparsest vector. It's got a zero, well, out of two components, it didn't have much freedom, but it has a zero component. It's, it's on, the, 
on the uh, on the axes. It's the things on the axes that have the smallest number of components. So, so uh, yeah. So, so this is the picture in L two, in in two. Sorry, the picture in two dimensions. So I'm in two D, and you can see that the winner is has a zero component. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and that's a fact that it extends into higher dimensions too, and that makes the L one norm. Special, as I've said. Yeah, is there more to say about that example? That's a, a, for a simple 2D uh, question, that really makes the point that the L1 winner is there. It's not further. You don't go further up the line, right? Because, because then, you're, then you have even, that's bad in all ways. You're, when you go up further, you're, you're adding some non-zero uh, first component, and you're increasing the non-zero second component. So, you're, that's a bad idea. That's a bad idea. This is this is the winner. And in a way, here's the picture. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I should prepare these lectures, but this one's coming out all right anyway. So this, so the picture there is the nearest ball hits at that point. And what is it? Can you see that? So that star is outside the circle. This is the L1 winner. So and that's the nearest, that's the, that's the blow up the L1 norm until it hits. That's the point where the L1 norm hits. Uh, do you see it? Just give it a little thought. That, that that another, uh, another geometric way to see the answer to this problem is you start at the origin and the, you blow up the norm until you get a, a, a point on the line. That satisfies your constraint. And because you were blowing up the norm, when it hits first, that's the smallest blow up possible. That's the, min that's the guy that minimizes. Yeah, so just think about that picture and I'll, I'll uh, draw it better somewhere too. Well, that's uh, vector norms. And then uh, I introduced some matrix norms, and let me just say a word about those. Yeah. OK, a word about matrix norms. So, so the matrix norms were uh, the, uh, so, so now I have a matrix A. And I want to define those same three norms again for a matrix. And this was the two norm. And what was the two norm of a matrix? Well, it was sigma 1 turned out to be. So I, that doesn't define it. Or it could define it, just say, OK. The largest singular value is the two norm of the matrix. But actually, it comes from somewhere. So I, I want to speak about this one first. The two norm. So, so, so it's the two norm of a matrix. And one way to see the two norm of a matrix is to connect it to the two norm of vectors. I'd like to connect the two norm of matrices to the two norm of vectors. And how shall I do that? I think I'm going to look at the two norm of AX over the two norm of X. So in a way, to me, that, that ratio is like the blow up factor. If A was 7 times the identity, to take an easy case, if A is 7 times the identity, what will that ratio be? Say it, yeah? 7. If A is, if A is 7i, this, this will be 7x, and this will be x, and norms, the factor 7 comes out, so that ratio will be 7. Okay. For me, the norm is 
takes, that's the blow up factor. When, so here, here's my, here's the idea of a matrix norm. Now I'm doing matrix, matrix norm from vector norm. And it, the answer will be the maximum blow up. The maximum of this ratio. I, I call that ratio the blow up factor. That's just a made up name. The maximum over all x's. All the, I look to see which vector gets blown up the most. And that is the norm of the matrix. I know I'm, I've, I've settled on norms of vectors. That's, that's done upstairs there. Now I'm looking at norms of matrices. And this is one way to get a good norm of a matrix that kind of comes from the two norm. So there would be other norms for matrices coming from other vector norms. And those we haven't seen. But the two norm is, this is a very important one. So what is the maximum value of this of that ratio for a matrix A, the claim is that it's sigma 1. Can I put a big equality there? Now, can we see why is, why is sigma 1 the answer to this problem? I can see a couple of ways to think about that, but that's a very important fact. I, in fact, this is a way to discover what sigma 1 is without all the other sigmas. If I look for the x that has the biggest blow up factor, and by the way, which x will it be? Which x will win the max competition here and be sigma 1 times as large as, as the, uh, uh, the ratio will be sigma 1? That'll be sigma 1. When is this thing sigma 1 times as large as that? For which x? Not for an eigenvector. If x was an eigenvector, what would that ratio be? Lambda. But if A is not a symmetric matrix, maybe the eigenvectors don't tell you the, the, way to, the exact way to go. What, so what vector do you, would you now guess? It's not an eigenvector. It is a singular vector. And which singular vector is it probably going to be? You, V1. Yeah, V1. Makes sense. Winner. So the winner of this competition is x equal V1. The first, the first right singular vector. And we better be able to check that. So again, this maximization problem, the answer tells you is in, in terms of the singular vectors. So that's a way to find the first singular vector without finding them all. And let's just plug in the first singular vector and uh, see that the ratio is, uh, see, what it, see that the ratio is sigma 1. So now let me plug it in. So, so what do I have? I, I want a v1 over length of v1. OK. And I'm hoping to get that answer. Well, what's the bottom of the denominator here? The length of v1 is 1. So no big deal there. That's 1. What, what's the length of the, of the top one? So, so is a v1, now what is a v1? If v1 is the first singular, first right singular vector, then a v1 is? Sigma 1 times u1. Remember the singular vector deals were a v equals sigma u. a v k equals sigma k u k. Remember that. It's, so they're not eigenvectors. They're singular vectors. So that's, that is uh, a v1 is the length of sigma 1 u1. And it's divided by 1. And, and of course, u1 is also a unit vector. So I just get sigma 1. 
Okay. So that's another way to say that you can find sigma one by solving this maximum problem, and you get that sigma one. Okay. And I could get other norms, matrix norms, by, by maximizing that blow-up factor in that vector norm. I won't do that now, just to keep uh, control of what we've got. Now, what, were the, what was the next matrix norm that came in last time? Very, very important one for deep learning and neural nets. It's, somehow it's a little simpler than this guy. And what's the, what was that matrix norm? What, what letter, whose name goes here? Frobenius, so capital F for Frobenius. And that, and what was that? That was the square root of the sum of the, all the, add up, add, all the AIJ squares. For all over the matrix and then take the square root. And then somebody asked a good question after class on Wednesday. What has that got to do with the sigmas? Because I, 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 my dis point was that these norms are the guys that go with the sigmas, that, that have nice formulas for the sigmas. And here it is. It's the square root of the sum of the squares of all the sigmas. This is beside, let me write Frobenius again. But, but this notation with an F is now pretty standard. And we should be able to see why that number is the same as that number. Um, yeah, I could. I could give you a reason or I could put it on the problem set. <laughs> yeah, I think it's better on the problem set because, it, it, first of all, I'd get off the hook right away. And secondly, this connection between, in, in Frobenius, that's like a beautiful fact about Frobenius norm that you add up all the sigma squares, this is m times n of them because it's a all filled matrix, or you add up, so another way to say it is, uh, we haven't written down the SVD today. A equal U sigma V transpose. And the point is that for the Frobenius norm, actually for all these norms, I can change U, it, it doesn't change the norm, so I can make U the identity. It's, U is, we all know, is an orthogonal matrix. And what I'm saying is orthogonal matrix U doesn't change any of these particular norms. So suppose it was the identity, same here. That could be the identity without changing the norm. So we're down to the norm of the, the Frobenius. So what's the Frobenius norm of, the, of that guy? What's the Frobenius norm of that diagonal matrix? Well, you're supposed to add up the squares of all the numbers in the matrix, and what do you get? You get that, right? So that's why this is the same as this, because the orthogonal guy there and the orthogonal guy there make no difference in the norm. But that takes checking, right? Yeah. But that's another way to see why the Frobenius norm gives this. And then finally, this was the nuclear norm. And actually, just before the, my lunch lecture on the subject of probability, I've had a learning morning. Uh, the lunch lecture was about this crazy way that humans behave, not us, but uh, uh, other humans. Uh, <laughs> other actual, well, no, I don't want to say that. <laughs> Take that out of the tape. Uh, uh, uh. Yeah, okay, anyway, that was that lecture. Well, before that was a lecture uh, for a, an hour plus uh, about deep learning by somebody who really, really has under, begun to understand what is happening 
inside. How does that gradient descent optimization algorithm pick out? What, what does it pick out as the, as, as the thing it learns? This, this is going to be the, you know, our goal in, the, in this course. We're not there yet. But the, his conjecture is that, that, yeah, so it's a conjecture. He doesn't have a proof. He's got proofs of some nice cases where things commute, but he hasn't got the whole thing yet. But it's pretty terrific work. So this, this was Professor Sreb Rowe, who's at, at, in, in Chicago. So he just announced his conjecture. And his conjecture is that in, in a model case, the deep learning that we'll learn about with the gradient descent that we'll learn about to find the best weight, that the point is that there are, in a typical deep learning problem these days, there are many more weights than samples. And so there are a lot of possible Minima. Many different weights give the same minimum loss because there's so many weights. It's, the problem is like got too many variables. But it turns out to be a very, very good thing. That's part of the success. And the, he believes that, uh, that the, uh, in a model situation that the, the, the optimization by gradient descent picks out the the weights that minimize the nuclear norm. So this would be a norm of a lot of weights. And uh, he thinks that's where the system goes. We'll see this. This was, comes up in compressed sensing, as I mentioned last time. So this, but now I, I have to remember what was, what was the definition. What, what, do you remember what the nuclear norm was? It's also. His, he often used, he used a little star instead of an N. I'll put that in the notes. Other people call it the trace norm. Let's, but I think this N kind of gives it a, a, a name, a notation you can remember. So let's call it the nuclear norm. Do you remember what that one was? It was, yeah, somebody's saying it right. Add the sigmas, yeah, just the sum of the sigmas. Like the L1 norm. Yeah, in a way that, so that's the idea, is that this is the natural sort of L1 type of norm for matrices. It's the L1 norm, yeah, of, of that sigma vector. This would be the L2 norm of the sigma vector. That would be the L infinity norm. Notice that the vector numbers, infinity, 2, and 1, get changed around to uh, when, you, when you look at the matrix, got it. Well, so that's an exciting idea, and it remains to be proved. Uh, and exper people are experimenting to see, does, is, it, is it true? Yeah. So that's a, a big thing for the future. Yes. Okay, so that's, today we've talked about norms, and the, the section of the notes will be all about norms. Um, we've taken a big leap into a comment about deep learning. And uh, this is what I want to say the most. And I say it to every class I teach at the, near the start of the semester. Uh, my, my feeling about what my job is is to teach you things or to join, you, join with you in learning things, as, as happened today. It's not to grade you. I don't spend any time uh, like, like losing sleep. You know, should, should that person take a one point or epsilon penalty for, for uh, turning it in four minutes late? Uh, hell with that, right? We've got a lot to do here. And uh, so anyway, we'll get on with the job. So homework. Three coming up, and uh, we, it'll be using the notes that you already have posted in Stellar for, for those sections, eight and nine and so, so on. And we'll keep going on Monday. Okay, see you Monday, and have a great weekend.